Hutter and approved the minutes of the, of the meeting of January 13th. Since I was the only one there, I looked over the minutes. They were perfect, so they're approved. Next is the approval of the food service pension application. And if you would like to go over that for James Miller. Sure, we have one person that is James Miller uh, with the cafeteria. Um, he is 69 years old. He is getting a regular pension. He elected the standard option. His monthly benefit will be 953.81, annualized to 11,445.72. Any questions? Uh, Jim, you can be on this committee too, right? I, I, I'm not right now, am I? As far as I know. Well, then I, I could be, or I, or I, or what? We have we have Joe right now, so why don't we do this? We'll just do me and Joe. Is there a motion to accept the uh, the pension application, Joe? Motion to accept the pension application, Frank. <laughs> I second it. All in favor? Aye. Opposed? No. Okay. I mean, motion passes. Anything else? Adjournment? We'll make a motion to have uh, Jim on the, on the food committee meeting with us. Uh, I'll second that. <laughs> uh, you guys are wonderful. Aye. <laughs> well, you know, the thing is that the, the food service... Uh, usually the president of the union. Is that correct, Jerry? I'm sorry. Can you repeat that? You dropped, you dropped out. Oh, I'm sorry. The president of the food service committee is, is also on it, but he hasn't been lately coming on the Zoom meetings. Um, Steve Browning is the president of the food service um, union. Um, I, he's been getting the, the invitations via email, the same as everyone else. Um, he has not indicated to us that he would not be attending, um, so I don't know what um, his status is. I can email him tomorrow and just find out if he um, had some other issue that prevented him from joining and ask in the future if it was going to be a food service meeting that he cannot attend, just to give us a heads up. That would be excellent. And so we are uh, going to increase that committee with uh, Jim Hendrickson and Joseph Prammer, okay? So that way there, even if he doesn't show, we have a, we'll have a quorum no matter what. Going okay? forward. Go, moving forward. Perfect. All right. So all right. we had a motion to adjourn, all in favor, aye. Motion aye. pass. It's now six o'clock. We will begin the regular meeting of the Norwalk Pension Board. Call the meeting to order. Uh, approval of the minutes. The people looked over the minutes. Motion. I'll make a motion to approve the minutes. The one thing was that um, there's the name Tiffany on here. There were two changes as far as who was in attendance. One was Ray is staff, and he's listed as a board member. And the other one is there was a name Tiffany that I have no idea who that is or why it was there. I don't know if you noticed that. Um, this is Jerry. I don't know any Tiffany either. Right. You know, there is a singer, Tiffany, there used to be a high school, uh, a girl who played at uh, malls and stuff like that. If you, if you Google her, you'll, <laughs> you'll know that. I think Brett was a fan back in those days when he was a kid. So I did this is Tiffany. Usually I get a Tiffany a lot. So just thought I'd point that out. I'm oh, oh, it's Chitsume. Oh, it's a misspelling of Chitsume. There you go. All right, so correct the minutes for that one then. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Well, you know what it is? Because Chitsume, you are on there as staff. No. So, okay, so Tiffany should be removed and Ray should go on staff. Right. Right? With those changes, is there a motion to accept the minutes? I'll make a motion to accept the minutes. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Gary, are you on? I saw you joined. I'm here. Okay, good. Perfect. Hi, everybody. Uh, hey, hello. <laughs> um, and Rich, are you on? Just so we know who's uh, in attendance. 
Okay. Once uh, once he once he got the silk once he got the silk chest of money, we'll never hear from him again. <laughs> <laughs> And uh, by the way, I, I did uh, email Charlie and converse with him. Charlie had had, he did come down with the virus. Uh, he's recovered and he is trying to get on tonight. I did forward him the link that we get. Hopefully he'd be able to come on. Please. I see him. He's on, he's on. He's on. He's got your name under his box, but Charlie, you're on, uh, you're on mute, Charlie. Charlie, we're glad you're okay. On the lower left of your zoom screen there's a little icon with a microphone click on that hi charlie you hear me we can hear yes. you hey welcome back Thank yeah you. welcome back it's good to know you're here good to be here finally and you're feeling well much better thank Excellent. goodness tell everybody don't get it <laughs> i had it. it it was awful no you did oh. yep but Sounds like you really had it, Charlie, bad. So I'm glad you're okay. Month on oxygen it was great fun. <laughs> oh, God. Oh, boy. Okay, is there any public comments? If not, we'll approve the pension application. Jerry? Yes, very good. Uh, we have one um, regular pension application. Mark Doherty was formerly with the Department of Public Works as an operator. Uh, he is 63 years old, so he is eligible for a regular pension. He elected option three. His monthly benefit will be 208.22, annualized to 24.98.64. The one thing, by the way, um, I did, and I did send an uh, an email to Jerry regarding this, and then I corrected it because. If you look, her the last date of employment was quite a bit, quite a ways away, right? Yes, he's been he's been uh, separated from service for quite a few years. So that's why that if you look, his pension, his annual pension is greater than his contribution to the plan. But that's the reason why. Is there a motion to accept this uh, pension? I'll move we accept it. Second. Second. I'll second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Um, Jerry, would you like to go over the list of the pensions quickly that were, this is the list of pensions that um, Ray approved? Yes, let me just pull up my file. Okay. These were the uh, staff reductions, is that what this is? Yeah. It was a voluntary retirement program that we rolled out um back in october of 2020 mm -hmm. okay do you want me to go through go through the entire list um is there no, you know what to go to read them all might be a little bit of time do we all have a copy it would Does be, everybody have a well the the list was in the uh yeah in the back of the bottom of the backup right yeah. in the back and Does everybody have a copy uh, everyone should have a everyone should have a copy because I believe Helen included it with the attachments that she distributed to everybody who was um, on yeah. the distribution list. There's no reason to read the whole thing, but you want to explain it to us. Yeah, if you Jerry, if you just explain what what the situation was, how they were passed, how, and then we. Because I can understand why you did not send, you know, five pages for forty people. You know, we had, you know, we had had a quite a list here, but just yeah. to go over quickly what the decision was, and um, and then we could just maybe if you just read off all the names without going over exactly what they're getting, we could read that ourselves. And then sure. we'll just, is that okay? That'll accelerate it. That'd be fine. Um, the, the criteria that was established for the voluntary retirement incentive was um, employees with, who were at least age 55 with at least 10 years of pensionable service. So everybody, now the, the, the eligibility list was larger 
than those that accepted. So it was not mandatory. Again, it was a voluntary incentive. Um, so the the candidates were about 99, 100 maybe uh, total candidates. Of those, you will see that approximately 45, 46 of those did make the election to retire. Um, they were given an additional service credit up to a maximum of 30, um, 38 years of service. So if their years of service with the incentive exceeded 38, they maxed out as 38 years of service. Um, there was no reduction actuarially for any early retirement for anybody who accepted the incentive. And so these were the 45, 44 people that did make the um, decision to um, retire earlier under the offering. What, but what was the, the offering? Was it an additional year or two years or? You know? it, was up to, it was up to three years of service provided again that they did not exceed 38 years of service. So if somebody was at um, 37 years of service, they did not get a three-year credit. They got a one-year credit only. But if somebody had 10 years of service, did they get 13? No. It was prorated? If somebody, well, in order to be eligible, you had to have at least 10 years of service. Otherwise, you would not have been eligible because under the terms of the pension plan, early retirement is age 55 coupled with 10 years of service. So you had to have at least 10 years of service to qualify under the incentive program. So, okay, but so we, at 20 years of service, what was the incentive to retire? Did you get an extra so that, you got, got an extra three year? years of service. An extra three years of service, yeah. Mm -hmm. I assume they did this to save the city money, correct? Say that again? I assume this was offered because it saves the city money. That is correct. Um, I go to cardio rehab and the, uh, Tuesday I was there and there was one other person there who happened to be the mayor and um, we did talk about this, and I think he told me that there's a number of positions around the number 20 that won't be refilled. And the people who are, who do take positions will no longer, you know, they'll, they will no longer be in the defined um, benefit. They'll be in the defined contribution, which saves the city money also. So in the long run, this was designed to save the city money and by reducing staff and then also to better define what the costs are for the pension. So it does make, you know, uh, Ray, I guess, worked on it and, uh, and Henry, and I guess it's a good plan. Were any of yes, these it, was a, it was a collaborative effort between the mayor's office, Ray and um, Henry from finance. Was anybody rehired after they retired? Good question. I didn't. I don't. I didn't hear the question. I'm sorry. Out of curiosity, were any of these people rehired after they retired? Um, anybody that was rehired was rehired either on a temporary basis to bridge the transition from. Um, a replacement or on a temporary basis part-time again just to were, basically fill a gap and if they were a new but they would then be a new retiree so they would not be adding to this pension is that correct that is correct so um maybe if we just if you read the names off and then uh, we could vote on it. Is that does that seem reasonable to the to the committee? Do we need to vote on it? It's already done. No, we're still supposed to vote on it because then I think I'm supposed to go in and sign them too. Well, yeah, we all have the, we all have the list in front of us. I don't know if we need to read them. Yeah, I, maybe we don't have to read them off. Is there any 
discussion or any questions on any of these? One thing, by the way, if you notice, um, Judy Archer's on there, formerly of our pension board. Mm -hmm. And um, anyways, is there anybody have any questions about any in particular? If no. not, is, is there a motion to, uh, to uh, vote to approve these pensions? I'm sure the paperwork has been been checked over by Jerry in, in the office, so I, I assume that's all correct. We had it, we had yes, we had several layers of peer review on um, the calculations. Assuming everything's correct, I'll move we approve these 44 pensions. Is there a second? Second, no second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Yes, unanimous. Excellent. Thank you. You're um, welcome. And Chitsume, you're on. Would you want to go review again what the implications are for the pension plan? I think we're going to have an influx of funds as a result, are we not? Chitsume? I'm sorry, what was that question again? Um, as a result of this the number of pensions that we just did and they added three years to all of them. So mm -hmm. that, um, and therefore the, the pension is gonna become um, more tax for the 40, 40 odd people and they're not gonna, their, their replacements aren't gonna be contributing. But wasn't there um, gonna be some funds that were um, added to the pension plan as a result? I don't think there was an additional fund that was added to the pension plan that I'm aware of. All right. Okay. Then we can move on then to uh, to the next topic. Well, before you, Frank, before you leave oh. this, so so Chitsume, this so these fund these retirees will start getting paid out when and this has that started already the payouts to them? Yeah, they already started. Um, we already started paying them out. I believe it was um, November payment. So they are getting their monthly um, benefit retiree payment at the moment. So what, what, did, what was the sort of increase in the uh, monthly or annual payout from the fund? I mean, there were some slight increase, but not that significant that I see. I mean, right now, I, I see our monthly um, benefit payments. It's about 2.7 million. I think we were at maybe 2.5 before. Okay. Yeah, we could. Somebody could calculate it, add them, add them up, and just yes. Yeah. Yeah. But we had a we expect. had a lot of changes Maybe too. A, too. No we basis. had uh, several. I'm sorry. We had several retiree that passed away that passed away um, this year also, and I noticed that it was a significantly more than in prior years. Yeah, I mean, you could just eyeball this, and if you just it looks like it's around thirty five hundred or four thousand average times forty five, that's one hundred and seventy five or eighty million a month. So, right. Okay. Correct. So a couple million a year. All right. Yeah, because the other thing is, it's a couple of million more going out a year, and it's less coming in. Right. Because all so the bottom line, our, our commitment is two point seven million per month in monthly in pension benefits. Correct. Yeah. Yes. Okay. All right. That's a good number. Yeah. Any other questions? Then we'll move on to. Uh, We approve the pension applications. So the participation in voluntary retirement program, is that going to be, who is going to present that? I didn't know that. Britt, is that you? No, yeah, oh Frank, yeah, I guess that is the voluntary retirement, right. Um, so then we're going to go right to Blackstone. Great. Um, before I turn it over to Roberta and the Blackstone team, just a brief introduction. Um, Blackstone is proposing modifying the investment management agreement uh, for limited partners, which uh, Norwalk has been since 2002. 
Uh, we wanted to bring Blackstone in to just provide an overview of those changes, as well as uh, you know a brief portfolio review, cover the strategy, team performance, uh, and provide the board with an update. Um, so if there are any questions, happy to answer them. Otherwise, I will turn it over to uh, Blackstone. Any questions? No. Sure okay, then we'll go to Blackstone. Okay, great. So you know, first off, I'd like to say thank you for having us come in today to your board meeting to talk about the park strategy. My name is Roberta Osborne. I'm a member of the client service team. I'm joined today by Rory Campbell, who's a managing director on our portfolio management team, and also Greg Bilsey, who's a managing director on our equities manager research team. So as Britt mentioned, we really have three objectives of today's call is to provide an update on the strategy evolution and the changed terms of the fund and the IMA also to discuss recent performance. And Nick, you know, we've actually had very strong past two years, so Greg will comment on that. And then lastly, we also wanted to give you an update on the areas of opportunity that we see going forward for the fund. So I'm sure you all are invested in many products. A quick reminder about PARC. The PARC strategy seeks to maximize alpha and generate consistent returns utilizing equity hedge fund managers. In general, we target a beta of about 0.4 to 0.6 to the MSCI world and have about 20 managers in the portfolio at any given time. We will generally allocate to third-party managers, but we also have the, the ability to opportunistically allocate to co-invest. Um, this is, you know, that is all similar to the way that we've been running the fund. Brett mentioned a few changes. The most notable change is that we'll be changing, we have changed the liquidity of the fund. So previously, you were able to redeem your capital on a quarterly basis, up to 50% of your total investment with us. We have changed that to where you can still redeem on a quarterly basis, but you're only able to redeem up to 25% of your investment. Um, and we've also introduced the ability to side pocket. Um, and both of these changes relate directly to our underlying managers and the terms that we're seeing there. So I'll hand it over to Rory, who can provide some context on and the rationale behind these changes. And then we'll turn it over to Greg to go through the portfolio. Can I ask one question? Yes. You, you hello. Um, you use the word pocket. Is is that kind of like called gating? So the, the side pocket, it's actually um so the 25% investor level gate. It, it would be more similar to what you just mentioned. Um, the side pocket is also often referred to as a special investment. And that actually is where you carve out a portion of the portfolio and you do not have the ability to redeem from that. And, the, and Rory will get into it in a minute, but it's really meant to be an, an investor protection um, so that if there are any illiquid positions in the fund, um, we have the ability to give everyone their pro rata portion of that and that if you're the last person in the fund, you don't then have a book full of liquid investments. Um, and, and we'll get into the portfolio in a minute. And, and this is a lot of talk about illiquidity. And I just wanna emphasize that this is an equity fund and we're not, the underlying investments we do not believe are illiquid. This is more about setting up a structure that we think will um, protect investors. And could I ask one more question? Is there a percentage that would be in a side pocket it's up to up to ten percent, but in in normal circumstances, we actually don't expect to utilize the side pocket. So Thank that's, you. That's that's hi Frank. Um, that's a provision, as Roberta said. That's that's not invoked constantly. It's just you know, in uh, in normal circumstances, there's no side pocket. It's the ability to invoke it should the fund have you know material redemptions. But I wanted to add one other thing too. You, you asked about the gate. When we talk about the 25% um, investor level gate, that's distinguished from the old interpretation of, of gates that we experienced in, in 2008, when funds that would suspend redemptions outright called it a gate. That is to us a suspension of redemptions. That's not what we're talking about here. What this is, is basically saying that the, the regular liquidity for all investors will be you're able to um, redeem 25% of your capital balance every quarter. So I just wanted to draw the distinction between uh, a gate meaning suspension and a gate meaning the li liquidity terms of the fund as we're talking about here. Um, another question then, you know, say you wanted to get 25%, does that mean that you could be out in a year or is it you have a, a million dollars and now you have 750,000 and it's 25% of the, it's a, the 
750,000? Yeah, no, it's a great question. So it's a cleanup. So the idea is that if you were to submit a full redemption, you would get a 25% of that redemption back every quarter. So it's not a 25% of an ever decreasing balance. So you're, you're with us forever. It's, uh, it's, it's a quarter of the, of the full, of the full amount paid out over, um, over the next uh, uh, four quarters. Excellent. Thank you. One quarter, one third, one half, and then full. Yes, that's right. Um, how many clients are, are in this product and how far through the uh, discussions in terms of having, how many of them have accepted the changes here? Roberto, I think you're on mute. Sorry, we, we have about 50 LPs that are in the park strategy, um, 50 external LPs that are in the park strategy. And this is in your fund. We also have an, an offshore version um, and a taxable version. Um, and I, I will have to come back on the ones that have not accepted, but it's it's very minimal. I would say it's, pro it's probably, it's certainly, it's probably five, I would say. Okay, um, and the, if you do not accept the liquidity changes, unfortunately, it's, it's not a, a vote on whether or not the fund should change the liquidity terms. It's something where either you'll become comfortable with the liquidity terms or um, you'll submit a redemption to exit the fund. Got it, thanks. No, no need to follow up, that's fine. Thank okay, you. thank you. Um, and to provide a little bit of portfolio context as to why we're changing these terms, you know, I would say if you look across the variety of hedge fund strategies, you know, equity long short is kind of, you know, in the middle to more liquid end of that spectrum. You get certain managers that have, you know, um, quarterly full liquidity. You also get some managers, um, particularly in the themes that Greg is about, will will describe to you later. The 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 areas we're focusing our investment efforts in this fund that have less liquid terms. You know whether it's um, you know uh, semi annual, annual, or beyond. So what we wanted to do is really match the liquidity for all investors to more closely to the underlying liquidity of the actual asset allocation so that there wasn't a, 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 a mis, there was you know not a, a, a large mismatch between the investor liquidity and the underlying liquidity of the actual allocations. So that's the context for the change. Is there a change in fees at all? So you are invested in the um, share class that has a 0% management fee and a 15% incentive fee. Um, and that remains unchanged. There is, you do have the ability to change fee structures if you'd like. The other options are a 1% management fee flat or a combination of management and incentive fee with this, which is a 50 BIPs management fee and a 7.5% incentive fee. Thank you. There's no other questions. We could go on with your discussion if you want a, the presentation. Sure, R Roberta, do you have the presentation to share by chance? Sure. Um, while Roberta is pulling that up, I, I can talk through um, the evolution of the parks mandate. Um, you know, I would over the last several years. Um, so as Roberta said, the, the, the mandate for PARC is really to focus on a range of market exposure. So call it a 40% to 60% market exposure or 0.4 to 0.6 beta to the equity markets. And then above that, try to maximize the alpha or the amount of return that's not explained by the stock market above that. So the idea is you know, um, to, to really kind of take less risk than the market, but still over the long term. Uh, provide kind of competitive returns um, that, that you would hope to achieve with, with a, a, an equity-like allocation. And we do this by, by allocating to 15 to 20 external hedge fund managers, plus an array of equity-focused co-investments as our internal um, co-investment team sources them. To give a little bit of history, you know, you, you've been long-term investors. You know, in 2019, towards the end of 2019, we sat down to reevaluate our approach, and this was off of the back of you know, by late 2019. The trailing three years for for the park vehicle was, was you know, call it seven and a half percent versus 15% for the S&P over the prior three years annualized. And that kind of, you know, that wasn't, that wasn't really good enough. So we sat down with the equity team um, and we really refocused our efforts on 
um, trying to source more thematic exposures that we saw, you know, based upon our research, based upon collaborative research that we do with our underlying managers, you know, really what we saw to be the, the, the dominant themes for, you know, the next three, five, 10 years in the long short equity space. Um, and the impact that that had is, or that has had on the portfolio, uh, I'll walk through a little bit kind of at a high level, but as we look to allocate more capital to managers that specialize in these themes to make sure we're still remaining balanced in what we consider to be sort of more blue chip, hard to access, closed capacity managers, it required uh, changing the allocations in the fund a little bit, um, improving them uh, as a way to access this kind of new thematic focus. So the first thing we did is towards the end of 2019, this fund, while an equity mandate, historically it had an allocation to what we call diversifiers. These were more kind of global macro managers, some, some multi-strategy managers. What we wanted to do is really focus this fund on its core mandate, which is you know, delivering um, equity uh, long short alpha on top of a, a tolerant or a, a, an accepted beta range of, of 0.4 to 0.6. So over the last you know year, we've moved a, a fairly significant amount of the, the funds exposure into these themes call it you know uh, 20 plus percent of the of the, the funds exposure over the last year into accessing some of these more concentrated themes that Greg will walk through. Now, some of these themes um, come with a, a higher degree of beta, and that's uh, that bec is because you know they're they're going into some of the niche markets where it's maybe a little bit more difficult to short. Some of uh, you know one of our themes is healthcare. Another one of our themes is you know uh, clean tech. These are areas where the the predominant opportunity side or set is on the long uh, is on the in the long book in each of the managers funds. So moving some of our exposure into these, these uh, uh, new themes has required us to rebalance the rest of the portfolio so that we re remain within that market exposure limit so that we remain within the, the, the expected beta and volatility targets that we monitor when we're doing uh, portfolio construction. So in order to do that, we've also in, uh, increased the amount of the portfolio that we have in more market neutral strategies. And there's a core allocation to a multi-manager separately managed account that we run named BMAP. And BMAP allocates to external managers. It does this in a cross collateralized. Basically, we have one pool of capital. There are 15 managers that, that manage the, that capital directly. Um, and they do it in generally a market neutral way. And we further risk manage that entire pool of assets to be relatively market neutral, call it a beta, you know, 0.05 to 0.1. So pretty agnostic to market moves. Um, so when you kind of take all of this together, you know, really what you've seen in the evolution of the funds allocations is pulling out the non-equity man, uh, managers so that we can focus on, on generating long short equity alpha, the best ideas in our long short equity space. Um, Two is uh, pushing or allocating additional capital to the themes that we've underwritten with our manager set and internally to be the most attractive. And three, to balance that out, um, we've increased the allocation to the equity diversifiers or more market neutral strategies across the board. Um, so that gives a little bit of context for what Greg will walk you through in terms of where we're seeing the opportunity set and where we've been allocating our marginal dollars um, in order to access those opportunities. Um, Roberta, should I touch on performance first? Yeah, let's touch about touch on 2020 performance and then we can talk about themes. Sure. Um, so as Roberta mentioned, it's been, you know, we, we, we had a strong 2020 on the back of a, a, a solid uh, 2019 um, across those two years we've annualized you know, roughly 17% uh, plus or minus. Uh, if you look at last year specifically, um, you know, we were up uh, north of 18% and we did that uh, with roughly a third less volatility than, than the broader markets. Um, so it was a strong year. Uh, and, and to Rory's point, it's been on the back of, you know, a transition to, um, uh, to, to move away from some of the diversifying strategies into more equity specific risk uh, in the portfolio and, and many of which uh, targeting some of the themes uh, that we'll touch on. But um, if we look at, you know, some of the main drivers to, to performance last year, 
um, you know, it, the the top th- or top three or four uh, all had a, a TMT growth bias. Um, so we had you know several managers like Co2 and Tire Global, which are um, you know very established uh, TMT growth ex Tiger Cubs. Uh, they have robust uh, private business that helps inform what they're doing on the public side. Um, and both of those managers, you know, generated uh, returns uh, roughly 50% in the case of Tiger and uh, roughly 80% uh, in the case of Co2. Um, so both managers were able to protect well uh, in the March drawdown and then were able to position the portfolio uh, for the last three quarters of the year to really take advantage of, of the market rally, especially as it relates to um, uh, you know the the appetite or demand uh, for TMT and broader broader growth uh, uh, allocation. Um, from a a more top down view as well, we did have uh, exposure to some China A. Uh, so the China A market was another a large contributor to performance, uh, generating or contributing roughly 500 basis points. Uh, so that's within our our quant strategy. Um, so that's been a, a more strategic uh, allocation that that the that BAM has made. Uh, I guess what's been about a year, Rory. Is that fair? That risk. Yeah. No. That's that's right, Greg. Um, and then from a detractor standpoint, um, it's it was fairly limited. Really, one one manager that uh, had um, had a very challenging March. Uh, after that, they recovered nicely, but unfortunately, uh, the March losses uh, uh, overwhelmed a bit. Uh, but all in all, you know, it was a strong year again, up roughly eighteen percent on the back of a, a pretty solid nineteen. Hey, Greg, this is Britt from Callen. Um, can you comment on the short squeeze that we saw over the past few months, and if any of these underlying managers were caught up in it, and kind of the outlook in terms of? Retail investors driving markets and, and the underlying managers reacting. Sure. Yeah. No. That was uh, uh, the last you know two weeks of January. Um, it was uh, uh, watching that price action uh, was quite remarkable. Um, you know, I had a lot of family members that aren't in finance asking me about GameStop, which uh, is always a, a weird sign. Um, but it, you know, we, we we did have a couple managers uh, that were caught up in it. Um, none that were really uh, significantly impacted directly by GameStop. D1 had some exposure there, um, but it's really the, the more of the retail phenomena that affected, um, you know, AMC, uh, uh, Bed Bath and Beyond, uh, Nokia, and and GameStop. Um, you had the Wall Street Bets. You had Reddit. Um, you basically had a bunch of these retail investors start attacking uh, hedge funds and, and really posting their positions online. Um, and then that was amplified by, you know, ease of accessing and putting on trades, right? You can just open up an account now on Robinhood. Um, I remember back in the day when I first opened up my first brokerage account, I had to go through form after form to be able to trade options. I was in high school. Um and of course, it was also like thirty dollars to trade. Um, so now it's you, you can trade freely, and anybody can you know put on option risk without you know going through a course or, or verifying that you understand you know the risk you're putting on. Um, so ease to trade and and the gamification of trading. If anybody's looked at the Robinhood app, um, you know you you buy a share and it like it explodes on your screen like congratulations you bought a, a share of Microsoft and it's it's a it's a it's interesting dynamic going on on the back of the pandemic and no more sports betting and trying to gamify trading. So it led to um, a, a new segment of the market uh, getting more involved, which I think longer term is probably a good thing um, to get you know the longer younger generation involved in in their finances. Uh, but unfortunately, in the situation, it definitely came to a head. Uh, and going after a couple of managers uh, in particular, namely Melvin. Um, but as a result, we did have a couple managers, you know, D1 specifically, and then a handful of managers within BMAP 
Um, BMAP, as Rory mentioned, is a, is a multi-manager platform. We have 13 sub-advisors. So although you see a 20% you know, line item there, um, the largest position is really 20% of that. So it's really a 4% look-through position. It's a very diversified, capital-efficient platform. The benefit there is we do see, we have trade files basically every five minutes to 30 minutes in most cases. So uh, the level of diligence and insight uh, and conversations we could have to, with the managers are far richer and greater. And as a result, the, the way for us to monitor what they're doing uh, real time is, is nearly perfect. Um, so we could call, have those conversations of, you know, you're an AMC, does that make sense right now, given the fundamentals that are going on, or more of the technicals that are going on, and what's your reaction function? Um, so we had the managers in our portfolio that suffered the worst were the managers that run dedicated um, and persistent single name shorts. Um, very early on, they, in most cases, were not impacted, like BMAP, which finished down roughly 7% on the month, uh, entered the third week effectively flat. I think it might've been up a little bit. And it was really that, that third week um, where you saw a significant um, uh, short squeeze that led to, I think it was an eight standard deviation degrossing in the market, right? So it forced a lot of pain on other high short interest stocks, uh, which led to contagion on the long side and for managers to unwind some of their long books. Um, so that was a, a, a challenging period. Um, we, we had conversations with all of the managers uh, that were involved. Um, and actually, interestingly, on the back of it, um, you've really heard a couple different reaction functions. One is, I'm not shorting anymore. I'm just not worth the headache. I'm just going to be either more directional or I'm going to use index. Um, the other is, um, I'm going to incorporate index in my shorts, or I'm going to run a more diversified short book, or I'm going to instill some additional risk management uh, on the way I think about my exposure to short interest, uh, ADTV, so average trailing volume or, or percent float. Um, and then you have you know, the conversations we're having with our managers, which actually are quite excited by this dynamic where they already monitor what percentage the float they owned or were short, what percentage of uh, of ADTV, they were short. Uh, what percentage of their short book uh, was high short interest? And what you're seeing is um, some managers completely exit uh, the space, or you're seeing um, a a, a level of diversification. So managers that you know ran shorts that were five, ten, in some cases fifteen percent of the book, and now they're no longer going to be running two to three percent. Now they're going to be running two to three percent shorts. Um, the conversations we've had with our managers, they're in that camp where they already ran diversified books. They already ran uh, a disciplined risk management approach on it. So they think they're going to see less competition on the short side going, going, uh, going, uh, going out. And then um, what they're just trying to be more mindful of is scraping Reddit message boards, getting a better sense of what's going on in retail. So they're trying to incorporate data on whether or not, you know, on the Wall Street Bets subreddit, um, they're talking about, you know, uh, G, uh, uh, GameStop to a much greater degree. And, you know, is the tone of that mentioning positive or negative? So they're trying to incorporate those type of qualitative aspects, but as it relates to competition on the short side, they're actually quite constructive and feel that there's going to be uh, less competition uh, going forward. Thanks, Greg. Um you know, we have numbers from December. Do you have numbers for January? What your performance was? Sure. Um, where I think it was, it was seven percent was what the flash. Right. Yes. Down seven point two net. So the largest. Yeah, the largest detractor there uh, was or uh, largest um, contributor was BMAP. So that was down you know, low sevens on the month. Again, that's a multi-manager platform. Really, there are two managers there that are two or three managers that got impacted. Um, that said, we've snapped back and I think we're, we've recovered roughly 50 plus percent of that, a little bit more on the month. Um, so we've had a nice snap back there. Uh, and then the next uh, largest manager in the portfolio is D1. Um, D1 was down roughly 20% as well. Uh, those losses largely stemmed on the short side. 
Um, we haven't received an updated estimate there, but just based on indication of, of what their reaction function was and the snapback we've seen in the market, uh, we'd expect a, a fairly meaningful snapback uh, from that portfolio. Could you tell me what, how your net long position is now and what the range is, has been for like the last year or two? Sure. Um, so the equity net that entered January um, was I think low 70s percent net uh, on a, a on a at the fund level. Um, that has likely come down a bit, but not meaningfully, to be honest. Uh, so we're probably in the high 60s, low 70s. We're still getting the January data. Uh, they'll take you know a little bit of time. BMAP, you know, for example, is run market neutral. That's hedged daily to be zero net. Um, again, that's a, a, a mandate that we have a lot more control and insight uh, into. Um, but the, the, the buildup from the rest of the managers is probably going to give you a high 60s, low 70s net. And what about how leveraged are they? Um, so the broader managers, so the broader platform is going to be closer to, you know, high 100s. I can and give you the, I can tell you the exact December. Sorry, just pulling it up. And I guess while you're pulling that up, um, this, you know, 65, 70% net long, is that expected going forward with the new themes that are being implemented in the portfolio? Um, so it's a, uh, so the gross entering the year was 170 uh, and the net was in the low 70s. Um, so on that, the uh, that is the cash net. The beta net is gonna be lower than that. Uh, we tend to have a, a beta mismatch between the long and short book. Um, and again, this is gross of, gross of any fees. So net of fees, you know, the, the beta is gonna be even lower, uh, the realized beta. Um, as relates to, you know, based on the themes that we're going to be discussing, uh, incorporating in the portfolio, um, the, the attractive aspect is there are uh, winners and losers on the back of these themes. Um, so I wouldn't expect the net to go up materially from here. Um, I think this is, you know, probably at the higher end of the range. I'm not saying it won't go higher, but um, I think given expectations of both um, you know, the managers in the pipeline, how the managers are currently positioned, et cetera. Um, and the fact that a lot of these themes, you know, managers are doing it in a more balanced way. Uh, and the fact that again, BMAP, which is the ballast to the portfolio at roughly 20% does run at, at market neutral. Thanks. Uh, I just want to be conscious of time. I think we have about five or 10 minutes. Uh, if you could hit on the key points before concluding, that would be great. Sure. Yeah. So, um, Greg, I'll just show this slide. You can kind of hit on some of the, the main themes. I know the group has the detailed slides they can go through at their leisure. Sure. Um, yeah. So really, it's it's uh, the four things we're targeting are digital transformation, healthcare innovation, clean tech, and the end-led innovation. Um, and again, you know, I, I think you read these and you, your first reaction is these are all long bias themes. Um, but the interesting aspect here is there are definitely long and short ways to play it because there are going to be winners and losers um, in this. Like if you look at um, on the digital transformation side, um, you know, we're still in the very early days of, of in the S curve on a number of trends, including, you know, cloud communication, cloud infrastructure, um, SaaS payments, e-commerce, et cetera. Um, then when you talk about, um, you know, Internet of Things, AI, machine learning, right? There's there's a lot of mega trends all embedded in, in digital transformation that you know we're working with managers to identify. Then you go to healthcare innovation, right? You've seen you, you've seen you know on the back of Operation Warp Speed some of the developments there. But when you look at the cost of uh, of um, of uh, next generation sequencing and AI when it comes to uh, to healthcare um, telemedicine and telehealth, um, you know, robotics and surgeries. Uh, it's an area that, you know, historically we played this more through biotech managers and we added a manager on Jan 1 
uh, Baker Brothers, which has a you know a stellar twenty plus career uh, in biotech, um, but we're trying to be mindful and 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 play the commercialization uh, in in healthcare services as well as you know robotics and AI. Um, then you go to clean tech, right? You, you see all the the um, uh, the what's going on in, in SPACs and DSPACs and, and IPOs. And you see a, a new renewable or battery or hydrogen or EV company uh, getting de uh, you know, a couple times a day um, at this rate. And you're seeing, you know, clean tech innovation across Europe and China, but you're seeing, you know, the US uh, definitely investing R&D here. Um, and interestingly, you know, this is going to lead to, you know, a lot of longs and shorts, long from the innovation side, short from, you know, legacy companies, but also, you know, some of these companies that are that are coming out in, in these SPACs and, and these are oh, yeah. very rich valuations. Um, and uh, lastly, on the EM, uh, we're looking at innovation and, and consumption uh, with an EM and just seeing uh, the rise of the middle class. Um, you're seeing, you know, China has significantly ramped up R&D over the last 20 years and will, will eclipse the U.S. in, in R&D in, in short order. Uh, you're seeing, you know, AI emerge outside the U.S. You're seeing infrastructure spend. So it's a, it's a very, it's an area we've probably been underweight uh, and it's an area that we are, we're growing uh, and, and we have a lot of uh, research behind to, to uh, get, get up to speed. How long do you stick with these themes? Um, again, so these themes are, we're trying to identify themes which um, are ripe for alpha. So alpha generation, and that is long and short. Um, so I think it's less um, staying with these themes per se and more trying to, you know, evaluate new themes that are that are becoming present and whether or not um, our managers are adapting to you know other areas or other like this could easily lead to right now I think you're probably long biased but you know as this evolves you could become short biased so it's it's areas of focus I wouldn't say that they are um, you know we are wedded to or dogmatic to any of these. I think it's just- I would, I would say that the, the horizon for these themes is multiple years into the future. These are, yeah. you know, these are transformative themes, but as Greg was talking about, um, the way that we approach allocating the portfolio is really a competition for capital approach, where if one theme becomes relatively more or less attractive, if new themes enter that we deem actually more attractive risk return wise than any of these four, you will see a rebalancing of these. You may see us exiting one theme in favor of another. And then as these individual themes, as Greg was saying, transform, you know, early stage tends to be, you know, longer bias as it matures, more shorting opportunities. They're, they could change in terms of the risk profile within the individual themes. But these, these evolve year to year, presumably. So if you, if you look back at your themes over the last five years, would you find, you know, fair amount of commonality or, or four different themes most years or how, you know, how would you describe I, it? I would say, and Greg, you know, please chime in. If you look at digital transformation, so TMT and technology managers, we have had, you know, concentrations in, in those themes for, uh, for, for years. Um, the newer approach to this is, you know, a, a little bit more focused on um, some of the, you know, the cloud infrastructure and some, some new, uh, more niche um, accessing of these so that the format of that theme has changed. Um, and we can expect it to persist going forward. Healthcare is another theme that we've had for, for many years as well. That has changed, you know, from, you know, Glenview and HealthCore to some of the more Baker Brothers, you know, earlier stage innovation, biotech, that kind of stuff. Um, clean tech and EM led innovation, I would say of the four on the page are the more recent themes um, in terms of how we're accessing it and more early stage in terms of the, the impacts that these themes are going to have in the market markets going forward. Greg, would you agree with all that? Yeah, yeah, I think you're, uh, you're generally seeing more expansions of the themes through innovation um, as opposed to newer themes added per se. So I think it's more of, you know, seeing another subcomponent of the digital transformation as opposed to seeing, you know, for a fifth theme. Mm -hmm. 
what, just one other question. Hopefully, it's not a not getting into a big discussion. But how do you see SPACs affecting the investment world? Is this a flash in the pan, or is this something that's going to get bigger and bigger over, over the next five years? Say, what, um, are your, what are your thoughts? Yeah, that's that's short answer if you can. I was going to say short answer, Greg. You can talk <laughs> about this for a long time, and we're happy to come back to talk about SPACs. Yeah. Uh, it's been a, it's been a great area for PNL. Um, you know, it really, if you can get in any of these D SPACs and pipes where you get a free look at the company, um, you get a, your shares to 10 and you have a, a good sense of where it's going to mark, um, at announcement. And then again, you know, when deal closes is, is a nice little free option. Um, but I, I think SPACs are definitely going to be here. Uh, for a long time. I think it's definitely changing the landscape of, of the ECM market. Um, I think you are going to see a, a change in regulatory oversight, right? The fact that, you know, if you IPO through a, a DSPAC, uh, through, a, uh, through, through a, a SPAC, um, and you could provide your five-year projections, right? Like you see all these uh, battery companies and EVs that are coming out and telling you what their 2025 projections are, right? Like if you do your typical S1, you can't provide projections. So there's going to have to be some type of even playing field. Um, and, and to be fair, a lot of our more fundamental managers are more constructive on, on the short prospects of a lot of these opportunities. So they think there's a lot of richness, a lot of, um, uh, the valuations are a bit over whack and they're actually excited to get some liquidity post uh, Piper playing technicals to go short. Um, but I think there's, there's going to have to be some type of common ground between a regular way uh, S1 um, or the, the more traditional S4, uh, which is how D SPACs occur in which you can provide your, you know, three, five year projections, uh, which you just can't do regular way through a, a normal IPO. Uh, but it is an area, you know, we have a robust ECM uh, business uh, broadly in BAM. One of the largest risk contribution within within BMAP is a ECM specialist. And it's been a phenomenal area uh, the last, you know, 15 months for us. Um, but it is an area that, you know, is, is very fluid and we're paying a lot of close attention to, especially on the, the regulatory side. All right, thanks. Great. So I think that's, you know, that's really what we wanted to cover. Happy to take any more questions. I guess the one thing I would also just maybe ask Rory to comment on is, you know, we talked about our views in the equity space because Park is an equity product, but at Blackstone, we're actually fairly um, bullish on equities and more so than we've been in, in kind of recent years. And Rory, could you maybe just say a comment or two about what we're doing with our equity allocation, increasing that in our diversified portfolios? Sure. Uh, you know, if you were to go back 10 years and look at our, our um, uh, diversified portfolios or flagship portfolio partners and custom funds that sort of track it with varying degrees of risk, the equity allocation, you know, was above 20 percent in, you know, uh, based upon our bottoms up sourcing um, our and plus our view on the equity space, you know, that had fallen to as low as call it 10 percent. Um, at its at its lows, it is recently you know are based upon um, some of the managers that uh, that Greg and team have sourced over the last eighteen months. Uh, more recently, with Joe Dowling coming in and having a lot of very interesting and exciting ideas in the equity space, um, some trading oriented managers, some early stage you know uh, pre IPO managers. Um, we are taking the strategic allocation to equity in our in our uh, uh, diversified vehicles up from 10 ish to call it more 15 to 20 um, over the medium term. So this is actually an area where um, based upon uh, what what Joe is sourcing for us and based upon a lot of the work that Greg and team has has done, the competition for capital is, is causing us to allocate more into the long short equity space. Um, so it's an area, as Roberta said, that, that we expect to continue to grow on um, to source new managers and allocations into the park vehicle. Um, so that's something that we can have ongoing discussions on if of interest to you. Uh, a question, do you, who's, you know, like you uh, right now, roughly 70% net long? 
do you set that or do your do you look forward to say we want to be net a certain long position or is that given over to all your managers? Oh, so we, you know, the managers certainly have discretion on managing their net exposures and betas within our underwritten, our underwritten range. So we do reviews before allocating. We monitor our managers to make sure that they are staying within their risk limits. Um, but we don't directly control the risk that they take. What we do directly control is the mix of managers such that the aggregate fund itself stays within its mandated risk limits of call it 0.4 to 0.6 beta. So, you know, right now I would say the expected beta of the fund is running at about 0.55. So it still has the ability, you know, while the net exposure is higher than that, you know, the, there's mismatch between betas of longs and shorts. So our, our, ex, our forward looking beta estimate is still within range, still has a little bit of room with its uh, above its kind of soft cap of 0.6. Um, but uh, so, you know, as we start um, looking at the aggregate mix of managers, if we want to take the exposure down, we don't tell the managers to do it themselves. We reallocate towards um, managers with risk profiles that, that benefit the fund's aggregate profile. Thank you. What, what are the, I didn't, I didn't see it in the deck, but what are the total assets in the fund right now? Total assets in the fund as of uh, February 1st is uh, 1.14 billion. Okay. Any other questions? If not, Britt, do you have any other questions? If not, we could just move on to the next topic and thank everybody for Blackstone. Yep, thank you everyone. Yep, thank you. Thank you for thank having you. us. And if you have any other questions, feel free to reach out directly or through Brett, we're happy to help. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks. Okay. So before we move on, I guess I wanted to we skip, see how everyone felt about the updated agreement changes. I think that the key factors here are the 10% side pocket or special investment pocket. Um, sorry, I'm getting a lot of background noise if everyone can mute. Um, so the, the key terms in the, in the updated proposal were the 10% side pocket or special investment uh, subset. And as they discussed, some of their underlying managers are already investing in private companies um, and they are not intending to use that as uh, an increase in illiquidity and an investment purpose. They're really just letting their underlying managers continue to invest how they see fit. Um, the other piece is the uh, redemption. So instead of 50% of your uh, allocation a quarter, you can now only redeem 25%. So it would theoretically take about a year for Norwalk to redeem their full investment. Uh, we've had a number of calls with our hedge fund team with Blackstone, uh, gone back and forth and really dug in. And I think from a high level, we understand the changes they're trying to make. Uh, and we do believe that these changes are in a trying to reduce potential gating. Um, you know, they have a billion dollars in the fund. The top 10 investment, top 10 clients in the fund are, uh, I'd say about 700 million. So, you know, there are some big clients in there. And if there was a run on the fund, this new proposal will allow them to stagger the illiquidity to make sure that, uh, you know, redemptions don't don't flood and, and cause issues for, for anyone like Norwalk. So from a calendar standpoint, we're comfortable with the changes. We did want to get, make sure the board was because a new IMA will have to be completed by Norwalk and sent to Blackstone. Uh, so I just wanted to uh, say that and see what the board had to say. Hey, Brett, do they manage other funds or is this their flagship and only fund? No, Blackstone manages billions and billions of, of alternative investment funds. So this, this is one of many. One of many, yes. And are they doing the same format with their other funds as well? You know, I don't have that context, to be honest, Joe. Um, 
I think this is more the way they see the investment world going in the long short equity space. I mean, I asked about the short squeeze because, you know, this retail investment base is a new reality for a lot of these short managers. And, you know, the investing in private companies they've seen with their underlying managers, uh, if they find good ideas and good investments, even if they're private, these underlying managers are, are going after them. Uh, so, so they really believe that it's, you know, an opportunity set for their underlying managers and, and where things are going. Um, but I don't have any context to say what, what other funds are, are doing. Within Blackstone, within Blackstone. Correct, correct, exactly. Yeah, I mean, if we're, if we're happy with their performance, you know, it's, it's kind of a take it or leave it here. We're out, you know, so it's not like we have not, there's no negotiation here. It's either accept it or leave. Agreed. Yep. And their performance has been strong as they noted, you know, fiscal year date up almost 21%. They're up almost 7% over the trailing five years annualized. So strong performance uh, from Blackstone. I'm, I'm fine with the changes they're proposing. Frank, you're on mute. Frank, were you uh, the, uh, the performance in January was down 7.2%. So they're not quite as doing quite as well. The one thing that shows me is that they're taking a lot of I mean, there's volatility in this market, but they were, that's a pretty big swing for a month. The other thing, one concern I have is, as far as the fund itself is, if 70%, 70 million, 700 million is in within 10 people, you know, one of the reasons why we took money out of Zeisinger years ago was because we were concerned of the concentration of a few people. And I should have asked the question about if they've had much in the way of redemptions. I'm just reviewing the fund as a fund too. Yeah, we've asked that and I asked for client information, total assets under management, et cetera. And uh, they've actually been gaining assets, uh, not losing them since uh, the last, they sent me their numbers in December and had about 950 million in the fund. And Rory said they had a, over 1.1 billion now. So we haven't seen that. But <clears throat> certainly something to think about in terms of how much money within the Norwalk portfolio is allocated specifically to Blackstone. Another question I have for you, Britt, is that um, when we look at the performance, you know, it's, you know, it's like 20.69 the end of December. Is that net of fees or is that gross? Because the fees would be 300. If I'm not mistaken, we're paying 15 Fifteen percent, so that would be three hundred. Three. Yeah, we'd have to see if I'm pretty sure it's gross. To be honest, uh, I did ask our hedge fund team about the fee schedule, and we still like the fee fee schedule that Norwalk is in, where it's zero percent management and fifteen percent performance. So for the month of January, you know, to start this year, they have to dig themselves out of that hole that they just put themselves in. Um, so Norwalk will benefit from that. Um, we can certainly revisit the fee structure if you wish, but I think we're in favor of the uh, performance only fee in this case. And um, no, I, I'm sorry, I guess I just was looking at it and thinking, well, at first looking at this, they're underperforming by, you, I don't expect them to beat the S&P, they're a hedge fund. Um, but it looks like at one point they're, they're underperforming by 150 basis points, but really they might be underperforming by 450 basis points because you're taking, you know, 15% of 20%, right? Yeah, I'd have to confirm. I mean, so if you look at the flash report, the hedge fund to fund strategic index is really, you know, that's basically a median peer group index. That is where we would really benchmark them to. I mean, we have the equity index benchmarks in there uh, for perspective, but 
we would not judge them. I mean, if they're having a, if they have a 0.5 or a 0.6 beta versus the MSCI world, they're never going to keep up with the equity markets that have occurred over the last 10 years. Right. Um, so when we look at them, when we evaluate their performance pattern, if they don't protect in a down equity market to a degree, then we would have concerns. Um, I think in terms of what they've done over the last three, five, 10 years uh, for Norwalk, I mean, Norwalk's been an investor with them for 18 years. Um, they've, they've done what they've been hired to do. And I think we're... Uh, certainly still have conviction in, in Blackstone Park Ave. I mean, they're, they're a hedge fund, but they benchmark themselves against the MSCI index, right? They do, no, but, but, but I mean, it, we can look at this over a, you know, a full market cycle. I think their goal would be to try to keep up with the MSCI world while you know, having two thirds of the volatility or the risk. Yeah, they've actually beat that, so. Right, MSCI. no, the MSCI world is. Oh, they, oh, now they have it. They beat it some. They years. have it. Yeah, some year. Last year they beat it. And next month we should have the quarterly report with all the details for Blackstone. I think you know, looking at a monthly flash report is probably not the best way to view them. Mm -hmm. um, but we can certainly dive into more details in the quarterly report to really see their pattern of performance. Is there? Um a consensus to stay with Blackstone and agree with the changes? Jim? Yeah, I, I would agree with that. What do you think, Joe? I, I don't have the numbers in front of me. How much, what percent of the portfolio of our portfolio do they have? They've got about 15 million, right? Is that right? No, no they got a little more than that. They have... Um, oh, 35. They have, 30, they have 35 million. They're 7% of the portfolio. Yeah. And then percent of the portfolio. Yeah, and that there's four million that was redeemed that came out in January. So, um, you can so it's probably around 30, 30 million right now. So as you said, it's a take it or leave it, and I don't want to leave them, so I think we take the changes. So, what about you, Kyrie? No, I think their track record over a long period of time is good. Um, I, I, I think to Charlie's point, it's take it or leave it. And it is what it is. And I think we stay with them. You know, we have enough in liquidity that having them uh, having a requirement basically to take only 25% a quarter that I don't think really hurts us. Yeah, we agree, Frank. I mean, this is not a source of liquidity if and when Norwalk needs to raise cash uh, immediately. So uh, in terms of, you know, where we would go, whether it's the Russell 1000, your fixed income managers, there are many other people that we would go or managers that we would go to to raise funds uh, before we would even think about touching uh, ABS or Blackstone. So would there be a motion to accept the changes in the Blackstone Park Avenue. By I'll someone. make a motion to accept the proposed changes from Blackstone. And Charlie seconded it. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? No. Passes unanimous. Thank you. Great. Great. Well, thank you everyone for the discussion. Um, if those guidelines hadn't been proposed, we hadn't planned on. Uh, having such a long meeting tonight. So we apologize, but um, you know, next up we have Jim Van Hewitt from Callan's Capital Markets Research Group. Uh, so Jim's joining us. Uh, he really led the asset allocation study that we've completed uh, and are presenting tonight for, for the board of Norwalk. And so just a little context, we haven't presented an asset allocation study since 2016. <clears throat> Um, and, you know, since 2016, there have been some changes. Uh, you know, we've, saw, we've seen the infrastructure portfolio wind down to basically zero. Uh, the private equity portfolio is, is well under target. And, you know, there's no, I guess, demand from the board that we've heard to um, 
invest further in these illiquid investments uh, like private infrastructure and private equity. So we wanted to revisit the asset allocation, talk about the capital markets, set some context on, on what we see going forward. Uh, and the goal here is to present you know, some asset allocation uh, mixes. So really fine tuning what the target asset allocation of the pension plan is and um, see where the board wants to go uh, and try to improve on, on the margin here uh, as we move forward. Uh, if there are any other questions, any questions, I'm happy to answer them. Otherwise, I will turn it over to Jim. And uh, Jim, I'll share my screen so that everyone can see the presentation. Great, thanks, Brett. Any questions? If not, let's move to slide one. Uh, we'll have a quick overview of what we're going to talk about uh, this evening. Um, you know, just kind of to put things in context, we have an introduction as to where the asset allocation fits. Uh, a big part of our process are our capital market uh, assumptions, and those are our forecasts of return and, uh, and risk in, in correlation. We want to talk about where those come from, uh, as well as their existing values. Uh, from that, we would move into asset allocation. As Britt mentioned earlier, we'll talk about the different alternatives that we would propose for you to evaluate. Uh, and then we will provide a, a summary and, and our thoughts of where you may go uh, going forward. So with that, if we can turn to slide three, please, Britt. Um, this uh, first slide is introduction, just as kind of a reminder of the importance of asset allocation. You know, just from a 50,000 foot level, I think it's important to, to center ourselves in terms of recognizing that the whole reason for the investment fund is to fund the, the pension benefits that you discussed earlier uh, in, in the meeting. And we recognize that, you know, a fair portion, uh, almost the, the vast majority of the volatility associated with the funded status or the difference between the assets and liabilities resides with, with the assets. The liabilities are not terribly volatile, uh, but as we've seen, assets can be significantly volatile. And really we view the asset allocation trade-off as one between the long-term and the short-term. Looking at the, the next major bullet point there, you can invest in an aggressive portfolio with the idea that you're going to earn more in the long run but there's gonna be substantially more volatility in the short run. So you're going to see the, the uh, volatility of let's say more equity in the portfolio and uh, more larger short-term changes in the funded status of the plan and potentially in the contributions to the plan to the extent that the actuary doesn't smooth them. Conversely, you can invest uh, in a more conservative type of portfolio which reduces the volatility of the funded status and it reduces the volatility of the contributions. But because you're going to earn less in the, in the long run, it actually increases the, the total contributions that you'll make to the plan. So it's through that, really that trade off between the amount of investment volatility you want to have and how that impacts the plan. There are, of course, other factors to consider, and we've already discussed one key factor that's, that's not related to return. Uh, and return volatility, and that's liquidity in the, in the fund. And we realize that that's you know, a very important question for, for many of our clients, uh, including you. And as a result, the combination of these decisions, there's no real quantitative way to decide uh, how to weight and evaluate each of these factors. So consequently, it really ends up being a subjective decision based on uh, quantitative data but at the end of the day, uh, different funds presented with the same data will come to different conclusions based on things such as their risk tolerance. So there really is no one size fits all. We want to uh, adapt this and evaluate this in the context uh, of your fund. We can move to slide four. This is really a kind of a schematic overview of, of what I mentioned before. Uh, in terms of the fund having many components that have to work together. So we have, once the benefits are set, uh, then they have to be funded either by contributions or by investment returns, because we all know the pension math. 
uh, that the contributions plus the investment returns have to equal ben benefits plus expenses. Uh, and to the extent that your contribution policy is fixed, we have to make up uh, the difference with the, the investments in the portfolio. If we move to slide five, with that as a background on the, the uh, investment account, or excuse me, with the, the contribution and funded status, and want to look a little bit more at what we're going to cover with regard to the asset allocation. Asset allocation is really a broad-based evaluation of how to structure the portfolio. So we're looking, you know, a little bit below the, the, the highest level of asset classes in terms of equity and debt. We're looking at U.S. equity, non-U.S. equity. Uh, we're looking at core fixed income. We're looking at, at um, alternatives. Uh, but we're not going to get down into things like capitalization. We're not going to get down into things like uh, growth of value within within equities. We're not going to talk about uh, investment grade versus high yield debt. We're going to keep this at a, at a very high level because really, as I mentioned earlier, that, that covers about 80 to 90 percent of the, the, the volatility in the fund. When we get down into those more uh, granular areas, there certainly are important. They certainly can add value. They could, certainly can uh, control risk, but to a much lesser extent than uh, your exposure to these different types of asset classes. If we move on, we'll go to, uh, well, let me first ask, before we get into the capital market assumptions, is there any question on kind of that overview uh, that I've given in terms of uh, context for how we evaluate uh, the asset allocation? No, we're good. I think we're good. Okay, good. Then moving on to the capital market assumptions. Uh, so again, these are our um, expectations for return, risk, and correlation. So return you know, volatility and diversification across asset classes. Uh, I would summarize the upper bullet point by saying that, you know, we're big believers in that it's not different this time. Uh, you know, we, we may have different starting points for the market that, that guide our, our projections, but in the end, we think that the equilibrium uh, values for these different asset classes probably don't change much uh, over, you know, relatively short uh, uh, periods. And so we're we're always moving toward an equilibrium within these markets from where, whatever market position we're, we're starting at. Um, we tend to be fairly reasonably yeah. conservative. Yeah. Well, Is there a question? don't think that, you know, this time it's different in the sense that interest rates are zero and that is different than it, it's ever been. <laughs> well, that's, that, that's, that's certainly a good point. I, and I, I guess that we would argue that they're not going to be zero forever. So, uh, and, and that will be reflected in the specific, for example, capital market expectations for, for fixed income. Our long-term equilibrium expectation for interest rates has really changed very little than from what it has been over the last several years. It's just starting at a lower point. And let me, uh, uh, if you will, let me delay a more detailed discussion of that for a couple of slides uh, where I'll bring out the, the specifics of that. But in terms of, of, you know, let's say equilibrium interest rates, um, you know, where we think markets will ultimately trade in terms of valuations and so forth, we think that that has not changed very much, even though the immediate circumstances have changed dramatically. Um, you know, when we look at these capital market expectations, we're looking at beta alone. So I mentioned before that we're not looking at not only not styles, but not individual managers. So we don't try and incorporate any type of alpha, which is specific to the, the managers that you choose. Um, and we, we try to be very systematic in terms of our development. We, we start with our economic forecasts. We recognize that those economic forecasts play on financial variables that have you know, long-term relationships between them. Uh, and that we break this down in terms of individual models and then aggregate it up in terms of the, the uh, asset allocation. So if we move to slide eight, um, again, I'm not going to spend much time on this because uh, we talked about it earlier in terms of the schematic. Here are the high level asset classes that, that we look at in a little bit more detail. And then finally, uh, on slide nine and 10, what I'll do is I'll give you just a brief overview of the, the things that we've looked at that are, that are driving 
uh, our expectations. Um, we actually spent a great deal of time on these expectations. I work in the Capital Markets Research Group, which is headquartered here in the, the San Francisco, well, I would have said San Francisco, but now that we're all dispersed in the San Francisco Bay Area, uh, there are nine members of this group. We generally spend uh, the time between, let's say, late summer and in December coming up with these uh, expectations. So we go and we gather data, uh, we implement the models, we do preliminary reviews with uh, strategic players within the firm. Uh, and then when we get close, we do a more firm-wide review of those expectations. Um, so there's a great deal of data that, that sits in the background of these next two slides that uh, we didn't feel we had time to discuss now, but which I'm, I'm happy to um, talk about uh, uh, further uh, to the extent that you have any questions. I would say that one of the things that we've noted and, and one of the things perhaps that, that um, you were alluding to, Frank, in terms of differences between where we've been before and where we are now is that with the high returns in the U.S. equity market relative to what we've experienced on average over the long term, you know, valuations are clearly uh, beyond what they have generally been historically, maybe with the exception of the dot-com bubble. Uh, and that has been a definitely something that we expect to be a headwind going forward to our, our equity returns. Less so in the non-U.S. equity market than in the U.S. equity market, uh, but, but certainly something that uh, we think is, is going to be problematic as, as we move forward. Um, and that has led to a, a significant decline in our expected equity returns going forward between uh, what we forecast in 2019 and what we forecast in, in the 2000 or excuse me, 2020 and what we're forecasting in 2021. What were you forecasting five years ago for stocks? I'm curious. Oh, uh, five, yeah, five years ago, we were probably in the high sevens, maybe eight for, for large cap US equity. Uh, and if you look forward, you can see we're now in the mid sixes. So, so it's certainly a significant decline. You know, and, and that's actually a, a relevant question from another standpoint. Our expectations have a 10 year time horizon to them. And this will be relevant as we talk about the fixed income returns as well. So usually under more normal circumstances, uh, for example, our equity expectations will change maybe year to year, 25 basis points or so, because we're just rolling out the year that we had, uh, that, that we've just been through. And then we've got one out year that's, that's 10 years forward. So there's not too much that, that changes in the years, in the forward years that we're reviewing. And so consequently, there's not too much change in the expectations from, from year to year. Um, clearly with the, the, the run-up uh, in uh, uh, the equity uh, returns that we experienced in, in 2020 versus the profits that were actually realized in 2020, um, you know, that, that caused us to, to have a more significant decline in the equity forecast uh, than we generally have. And similarly, as we, if we move to slide 10, you know, uh, this is a, a, a very summary view of the domestic fixed income market that's represented by the, uh, the aggregate index. And I, I think we've, we've, noted and we recognize something that is you know is, is common in the industry and that that the fixed income return is highly dependent on the initial yield uh, for any fixed income investment uh, and so what we see here in the um, the greenish line is the the forward 10-year return and if you look at this as, as of December 10th what that is is that's the the yield on the aggregate index uh, with the blue line, and then the green line is the subsequent 10-year return. So it's the 10-year return actually through the end of uh, 2020. Uh, and so you can see that there's a close correspondence between those, those two lines. And therefore, the, the blue line as of the end of 2020 is going to be relatively close to our overall fixed income expectation uh, for the next 10 years. And you can see that's below 2%. If, and then we have, there are many other, you know, facets to how we forecast fixed income, but this is really a broad uh, uh, benchmark that we use to, to focus our fixed income expectations. So if you took inflation out of this chart, you know, if you adjusted these returns, you know, for real rather than nominal, would it 
presumably be a lot flatter? Yeah, um, I, I, yeah, I definitely think that, that that's fair to say because clearly the real yields have been lower in the earlier years than, than the nominal yields and are probably closer. But there's, historically, they're still going to be higher than where they are today, uh, mm -hmm. but they would be closer on a real basis than they would be on a nominal basis. That's, that's a good point. So we're looking for but the correspondence would be the same. Yeah. I'm sorry, go ahead, please. So we're looking for returns in the bonds over the next 10 years to be under 2% a year. Yeah, that's, that's a great segue into the, the next slide uh, where we actually list our specific capital market expectations. And if you look at under the, the fixed income segment, which is in the middle of this table, uh, second line down, core U.S. fixed income, the highlighted green column is the 10-year geometric return for the aggregate index, and that's 1.75%. You know, you got, <clears throat> on this chart, you got high yield at 4.85, and I think, didn't it, in the last few days, it traded down just below 4%. Yeah, now recognize that these are these are, are total returns rather than, than yields, and these are averages over a 10 year time horizon. So you're looking for less than 5% total return in high yield over the next 10 years? Yeah, that's an accurate read of, of what we're looking at. We're like, we're going to less than 4 and 435. Is that right? Yeah, yeah. That's that's where I was getting with the, with the less than four and a half. We're looking at four thirty five on average for the next ten years. Uh, and it doesn't get any better in the equity portion of this table. If you go up to the top, you know, broad U.S. equity, the top line there, Russell three thousand. You know, we're looking at six six, uh, slightly less for large cap, a minor small cap premium. So six and a half for S and P five hundred uh, six. Seven for the Russell 2500. Jim, do you know if you looked at uh, look back over history? At at you know, I'm looking at more at the real numbers than the nominal numbers. Uh, you know, if you look at broad U.S. equity, for example, at 4.6 on a real basis. Mm -hmm. You know, what what would you say that's been? You know, if you look. If you, if you were looking at this, you know, 10, going back 10 years, 20 years, 30 years, how, how different would that be? Again, taking out the inflation component. Yeah, it certainly is measurably different. And the further back you go, the greater the spread is, is going to be. Uh, you know, we have, you know, in the course of my career, I've seen this uh, on, on a real basis go out to like 6%. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, and, and certainly premiums over fixed income have have been higher. So the the you know capital market line, for lack of a better term, is flatter uh, than than we've seen for well uh, than than we've seen probably ever. Uh, which I would interpret or I would uh, rephrase as saying you're getting less and less compensation for the amount of risk that you're taking as you move out in terms of more aggressive investments. And, and what are the underlying macroeconomic causes of that? Um, you know, I, I mean, I, I think that's really the, the, the key question in all of this. And I, I think that it's, uh, I, I think that there are several things that, that I would allude to. I think probably one of the most important things is that there's, there's more money chasing fewer investments, right? So there, there's, there's more savings, especially in the emerging markets. Uh, there is more savings, even though, however, even in the developed markets, I think the uh, rate of productivity growth that is generating um, profitability is, has certainly declined uh, over the last 10, 20, 30 years. Uh, so there are fewer profits to distribute to those, those uh, a greater assets that are being invested uh, in the market. Um, I, I thought those are probably the two key themes uh, that, that we have investigated to explain that, that lower or the, the lesser slope in, in the risk return trade-off. 
Are those two factors kind of equal weighted in your mind or is one more dominant? Um, you know, productivity comes and goes. Uh, productivity cycles through time. Uh, so I, I think that the, the greater level of capital chasing investment returns is, is probably modestly more dominant than, than the productivity growth. But put it another way, the, the, the world's gotten richer and everyone's putting their money into the same stuff. Yeah, yeah. There, 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 are, there are only so many good, profitable ideas to to invest in, and there are more people investing in them. Yep. Okay. So the you, really, the, the you believe? Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead, Frank, wants to... go ahead, Frank. Go ahead. I was going to say, you believe that inflation will be two percent on average over the next ten years? Yeah, that's, that's, that's our forecast. And that is probably, you know, I said we start on this uh, process in, in August and, and it continues through December. That was probably the most challenging forecast to, to arrive at uh, because there are certainly disinflationary pressures uh, on economies throughout the world now, not only with, with uh, COVID-19, but, you know, with, with other demographic trends. On the one hand, um, you know, on, on the other hand, the, the, you know, economy is, you know, certainly flush with, with cash and with low cost financing, uh, which would certainly lead one to believe that inflation is, uh, you know, would likely rise over this time frame. Uh, I think one of the things that had us keep the inflation down as low as 2% is we've been saying that inflation is going to go up for the last 20 years. Uh, you know, you can you can only be wrong so many times before you get uh, a little bit gun shy in terms of you know forecasting significantly increasing inflation. The one thing that I would add again, and I think I mentioned it before, is that these are average values over the 10-year time horizon uh, of the forecast, and that in the out years we are looking at inflation that's on the the two and a quarter to two and a half percent level. I don't think it's going to get much higher than that because we think that the Fed is going to fight inflation for some time going forward. Um, but you know, just these these early low years uh, keep that average down on the order of two percent. So, so the purpose of this exercise, this asset allocation exercise, is for us as a board to look at your projected returns and come up with what we feel is the proper allocation for our plan? Well, certainly the returns are reflected in some alternative allocations that we'll show you in subsequent slides. So indirectly, the answer to your, your question is yes, but we're not gonna ask you to construct the portfolios yourselves. We're going to show you some example portfolios uh, that we could, you know, alter based on the uh, the feedback that we get from you. Basically, it looks like U.S. equities is the place to be, anyways. I mean, yeah, it, yeah. It, it really is challenging to be outside of equity. Yeah, go ahead, Brett. Oh, uh, thanks, Jim. I think I think you know we could split hairs with our capital market assumptions, uh, and certainly, you know, we could talk about them at length. I think the goal here is there, this isn't necessarily uh, science and putting these together. There's a lot of art that goes into capital market assumptions and a lot of art uh, involved in the modeling. And when it comes to making all that work, as Jim knows much more than, than I ever will uh, in putting these together, um, that there's a give and take between you know what our projections are, what we think they are, and, and the debate that goes behind them. And you know, Joe, to your point, we're not suggesting that the pension plan goes 100% in US equity, right? Like risk and volatility are, are very important factors in how a pension plan gets there uh, and the path of a pension plan, the path of the returns. So these are really the starting point for putting those mixes together. And it's not necessarily to blow up the current asset allocation. It's really, is there an opportunity given where we think the world is going in the next 10 years, where the current allocation is of the pension plan to modify some things on the margin 
with the hopes of a better outcome. Okay. Yeah, so. Yeah, and, and look, yeah, okay, so go ahead. I, as I say, Joe, just to, just to look at that, I, I played around with some numbers this afternoon using these um, you know, nominal projections here by asset class, lining up our current allocation and what we might go to. If we pushed our equity allocation from 63 to 75%, we would only pick up 67 basis points on a blended return. It doesn't steer the ship that hard is the point. Yeah, you're actually making the point that, that I was going to make. Uh, you know, Brett uh, alluded to, uh, you know, the, the risk side of, of this. If you look, you know, the, the inclination is to put more equity in the portfolio, even though, let's say, the S&P is only at 6.5%. But the volatility, the standard deviation, the other highlighted column there is closing in on 18% versus if you look down to the core fixed income side, the, the volatility there is, is under four, three and, and three quarters percent. Uh, so this, this has two things to us, and that's that, you know, as, as much as we dislike the sub two expect, expected rate of return for fixed income on the one hand, just in terms of controlling volatility, you need to have a significant slug of fixed income in the portfolio, first of all. And then secondly, for the amount of uh, return that you get by moving into additional equity uh, is disproportionate to the amount of risk that you take on. So you're getting about four times the return by moving into something like the S&P 500 relative to the um, uh, the aggregate index on the one hand. On the other hand, as I say, you're increasing risk on the order of five times. Uh, so that's that gets to to your point, I think, Jim, that um, you know you're just not getting paid substantially for taking on more risk. Well, you know, let's talk can about I, uh, over the last seven years, the domestic fixed income return has been 4.2 percent, and for that same period of time. The equity has been 8.5%, so it's been 100% more. So it seems like it was worth taking that extra risk. And the thing is this, there's a level where I believe I read, I did someone send me some stuff that even if right now bonds went to zero, the 10 year went to zero, it's only gonna be a return of 10%. And the, the risk in the bond market a lot of times people don't take it to me as seriously as it could be. Now, my experience is that I moved to Chicago in 1977 to start trading bond index futures and I saw bonds and I heard people say you could never sell enough bonds at 10% and they went to 15. And the bond, the 8% contract there that's now a 6% traded from 105 to 48. The bonds lost over half their value. So there is a lot of risk in a in a fixed income portfolio, right? Do do you agree with that? I mean, there's a there could be a lot of risk. I mean, oil is Brent's trading above sixty dollars. Uh, steel prices are up. Grains are up. Uh, lumber is up. Almost lumber has tripled in three years. You know, building a house and it costs another thirty thousand dollars to frame it. It's a lot of money. So the Fed can keep pumping money for a long time. Platinum's up twenty five percent in three months. You know, uh, palladium used to trade it in two thousand and nine. It traded one hundred seven hundred seventy dollars. Now it's twenty three hundred dollars. There's a lot of risk in fixed income that I don't think people consider. Would you agree with that? I, I would certainly agree with that. And, and I would quantify it by saying that there's more risk in fixed income than there was two, three, five years ago, in as much as with the declining interest rates that we've experienced, uh, corresponding to that is an increase in duration uh, in, the, in, the, in the market, right? So we've moved from about a you know, four and a half to five duration up to, you know, six plus uh, in terms of the, the, the aggregate index. So there is, there's definitely decided risk in the fixed income, uh, in the fixed income market. I think one of the things that we, we keep in mind is that the 
the appreciation or the potential depreciation associated with um, increasing interest rates, we believe is going to be stretched out over a number of years. You know, so there are going to be a number of years of you know, potential capital losses. Uh, so let's say five years of potential capital losses that are you know, relatively small in each individual year, but certainly add up over that five-year time horizon. But those losses are also offset to a, a certain degree by the increases in yield associated with those losses. Right, but if you own a 10-year now, that had a, if someone bought the 10-year that said yield 80 basis points, and it did trade at a premium, at some level that you're only going to get your money back plus 80 basis points over 10 years, right? Right, yeah, that's the math. Right. When you talk about risk, obviously you guys are the pros when dealing with institutions. When we talk about risk and the risk is the market goes down or an asset goes down in a certain period of time. And the risk is that you need to you need that asset while the market is down. When we look at risk with what we're dealing with, it's not like risk, what I'm dealing with, I have a finite life in my life, right? We all have finite lives. What's the lifespan of this pension plan? We, uh, is it 30 years? Is it 25 years? Certainly with all of our clients, you know, that have open defined benefit pension plans, we look at them at perp as perpetuities. So, so, so it's so still, still you know, 30 years plus. Yeah, this, this is closed. So for, Joe, I would say, you know, say it's 40 to 50 years. And sure. I think the one part that is tough with pension plans is what I said earlier is the road along that 40 or 50 years matters. So you know, fixed income, the expectation is very low return, very low risk. If the pension plan is down 25% in a year, the city's going to have to contribute significantly more the following year than they would have if it had been up 5%. Uh, and that's kind of the give and take that we have to take when it comes to creating a target asset allocation and developing these potential mixes is... <clears throat> what's the road to get there? And, and for each unit of risk, are you being rewarded enough to take that risk as, as Jim has alluded to? Okay, so even though it's a 40 to 50 year time horizon, Brett, you bring up a good point. Our, our uh, performance or the plan's performance is more, you're also looking at it on, a sh on short term increments based on what, what, what the city's got to kick in. So even though it's got a 40, 50 year time horizon, we're looking at shorter increments. Well, we don't, we don't want the road to be too bumpy, I think is what he's saying. Well said. Well said. So Joe, big, big picture on this. So Chitsumi told us earlier, we're drawing, we're paying out about 2.7 a month. That's about 32 million a year. 30 divided by 500,000 is 6.4% a year. Exactly, yep. I was curious, Chitsume, she's been doing this for I don't know how long. How much has that monthly figure fluctuated since you've been here based on people uh, dying and also more people retiring? Has that number fluctuated greatly, Chitsume? No, I don't see it fluctuate that significantly. I mean, it's just that this year, because of those 44 retirees, yep. um, that's yeah, that's the, the way the big jump is going to be is starting in this year. Okay, so it's about 2.7 a month, which is what Jim said, 32 million bucks a year. And that's been relatively consistent. No, it was 2.2 before, right? It's, it's yeah. gone up. Well, it's gone up over time. Plus, plus, remember that the amount, those 44 people, their replacements are not going to be putting money in. So if you look at what their salaries were, and I think, isn't it like 4% they're paying now or 5% Chitsume? 
roughly? Yes, but don't forget that we also have employee employee contribution that I send to the fu- to the pension fund, and that's okay. around two two hundred. Uh, 250, 300,000. A month. Correct. Right. But, but but that employee number is going to be going, is just continues to go down. Right? Correct. Yeah. Right. That's what I'm saying. It, it's going to go down by quite a bit this year with all these retirees. Yeah. The, the, the fund has a life, but it's, it's certainly longer than 10 or 15 years, which says we want to avoid going too, too, too many ups and downs that are too severe. That's the point, I think. Okay, I got it. Okay. Um, one, of the and one, one quick question, Jim, if you go back to that slide where you had the, the, the returns by year, um, Britt, can yeah, you the equity returns on nine, yeah. Yeah, that one. So the boxes on here are what, the last 10 to 12 years, right? Yeah. It looks like they're disproportionately on the right-hand side of this. What, what yeah. do I take from that? You know, there's only one outlier, which is 2008 on the on the, you know, you out of standard deviation. There are a couple standard deviations out on the left there. Everything else is stacked up on the right. What do you take away from that picture? Yeah, I mean, I, I think this goes back to the discussion that we had earlier in terms of, um, you know, incoming assets driving up prices, uh, stretching valuations over where they've been historically. Um, you know, th- there's only so long that this can continue. I mean, okay. I don't think we're going to see, you know, PEs at 30 in the, uh, uh, for the S&P 500. So I, that is a major driver of why we're looking at mid sixes for our equity expectations going forward. Okay. So savings over this, the last 10 years have really accelerated and now starting to plateau is what you're saying, I think. Yeah. Yeah, okay. All right, thanks. So, so Britt, are we, uh, is, there, is there, are you recommending a change in our allocations at the end of this or where, where do we sit? Yeah, I think, you know, I wanted, we wanted to introduce the capital market assumptions because they really drive a lot of the modeling that goes on. So, you know, if it's okay with everyone, we'll move on um, from the assumptions and, and get into, you know, more of the proposed alternative mixes. Yep. Great. So um, we can start on, uh, yeah, slide 14, just to give you a sense of here's, here's where we are now, <clears throat> excuse me. The existing target is on the on the left hand side. The current allocation is on the right hand side. Um, one of the things that we note in the bottom here is that the real assets are under allocated relative to your existing target, and that's a function of the um, the runoff of the infrastructure investments uh, and the, the entirety of the real assets is or close to the entirety of the real assets is invested in the, uh, the PIMCO All Asset Fund. Um, similarly, on the private equity side, you have a target of 6%. Uh, that's now running at about 4%. And again, the, the reflective of the decision to not further invest in private equity to uh, uh, promote the, the, the liquidity uh, associated with the, uh, the, the investments in the portfolio. You know, one of the things though, um, we did when we set our targets, and uh, we've sp- spoken about this when we give our presentation, our targets are not f- as fixed. They are very broad, right, Britt? Yep, there are ranges, certainly, yeah, Frank. We have, and large, and... we have large ranges. So we have some things down to zero. Right, but essentially what we're exploring here today, and we can, discuss the investment policy statement following is, you know, right now there's a 6% target to infrastructure with $0 investing in infrastructure and zero plans to invest in infrastructure. Instead of over allocating to other targets, even if they're within the range, the purpose of this is to really understand the risk and return attributes of removing that infrastructure target 
seeing how there aren't going to be any investments going forward. Or, you know, even with the current 4% private equity, you're never going to get close to a 6% target uh, by not continuing to invest. So we're really trying to not necessarily say that there's anything wrong with the ranges, but fine tune the target so that it's more in line with how the plan looks now and where the board thinks it should be going forward. So maybe within our ranges, we have the target, right? Like that's exactly right. We're not, we're not saying get rid of the ranges. We're, we're just trying to understand and fine tune the target. So it more matches one, the current plan and the current target asset allocation, um, and where, you know, as we move through this, as Jim walks us through this, you know, where instead of having a 6% target to infrastructure, where might that money be allocated uh, in the portfolio? Because it's already being allocated elsewhere, but let's see what the results are, how it looks when we model it and what some of the alternatives might look like. Sounds good to me. Okay, so we can actually get to the alternatives on slide 15, the next next slide here. Um, and for, okay, so we have the, the asset allocation, or excuse me, the asset classes that you're uh, currently invested in uh, listed on the left-hand side. We have the target and the actual um, asset allocation uh, from, well, the existing target and the actual asset allocation from uh, late last year, <clears throat> pardon me. And then we have the alternatives are the four uh, mixes on the right-hand side. Um, we say at the top of those four mixes that these are optimal mixes. And by optimal, you may well be familiar with this, but by optimal, what we mean is that for each of the targets, for each of the targeted uh, compound returns that you see the second line from the bottom, these are the combinations of assets that meet that targeted rate of return uh, at the least amount of risk. Now we've done a, a little bit of manipulation of that uh, idea when we structured these targets, because what we did was we, we created these targets, targets iteratively so that they would have different increments of fixed income in the portfolio. Starting with the, the left-hand side, where we made the, the more conservative portfolio, uh, one that has 35% fixed income in it. So we had kind of an implied uh, targeted rate of return of just under 5% uh, and the market minimized the risk, or excuse me, the, the model minimized the risk. Uh, then we go over and we have a reduced risk level that has 25% of the portfolio of fixed income, so 5% more than you have now. Um, and then that has the almost 4.5% return, uh, compounded 10 uh, year rate of return uh, that you see at the bottom there. If you maintain what we call maintain the risk level, and again, that's dictated by the fixed income allocation, which is 20%, which is consistent with your, your target and actual asset allocation. Um, you can see that the, the structure of that target there. Uh, and then we wanted to have the, the right-hand bookend here with a more aggressive asset allocation with only 10% of the portfolio in, in fixed income to see what, what that would do. Um, and I, I think it's interesting, and I, I think this is, uh, aligns well with the point that Jim made earlier. If we reduce the fixed income allocation from 20% to 10%, uh, notice that we pick up you know, 43 basis points in 10-year in uh, expected rate of return uh, while increasing the standard deviation by almost 2%. Um, so you don't really move the return needle a huge amount uh, yet you increase the volatility, you increase that, that short-term uncertainty by a significant amount. So the other question here is that as we, we show the, the decline in the allocations to fixed income as we move from left to right, as Brett pointed out, where, where are those uh, assets reallocated? Well, given the limitations uh, that we have in terms of 
you know, not a, allocating additional assets to, to private equity, uh, you know, limiting to a certain extent the amount of real assets that we have in the portfolio. Much of the redistribution of assets goes into the, the public equity markets. So where you could, where you see now that your existing target uh, for domestic equity is 27%, you can see for a comparable risk uh, at portfolio with 20% in fixed income, that level goes up to 35%. Similarly, international equity goes up marginally from 22 to 23%. So really, what we're doing is we're reallocating from these less liquid asset classes to the more liquid asset classes in an effort to keep the portfolio return up. Uh, they tend to go into the uh, public equity portion of the portfolio. I should say that there are some underlying constraints on the diversifying asset classes, so global long short, um, absolute return and, and real assets. Uh, we wanted to keep those, uh, the, the sum of those the same as what you have now, because we think that in this low interest rate environment with poor fixed income returns, these diversifying assets uh, really make some, make some sense. Uh, and what that resulted in is uh, similar allocations to absolute return and global long short. And by virtue of the fact that we won't be having infrastructure in the portfolio, uh, a modestly reduced allocation to, to real assets, which would be represented or which would be invested in the, the PIMCO portfolio. Yeah, um, you know, one of the things we have the money, the real assets we have right now, I think it's around 9%. And real, I look at it as um, I think that PIMCO has talked about like a three-legged stool and the third of it is roughly in inflation and, and a third of it is in stocks or so. And so to me, that's, um, I'm, I'm not sure exactly how you look at real assets, but one of the ways I look at the, the real assets is we have some money in inflation. I mean, and if you look at um, the return over the last five years for PIMCO's, you know, has been reasonable. Um, you know, and I think that, you know, that's something that we should consider as part of the, almost part of a stock portfolio and part of an inflation hedge portfolio. Would you agree with that? I mean, I don't know what you define real assets as. Is that real estate? Is it, you know, what do you define real assets as? Well, real estate certainly is a facet of real assets. These are more liquid real assets. And as you point out, they're, they're diversified, um, you know, not inflation hedging assets, but inflation sensitive assets. Uh, and the advantage there is that should, as we talked about earlier, should inflation kick up, these assets are, are likely to perform, you know, better than some other elements of the, of the portfolio, especially the, the, the bond portion of the portfolio. But by virtue of that, they also, even in less inflationary environments, tend to diversify these other components of the portfolio tend to diversify, you know, public equity, uh, tend to diversify public fixed income. Because, you know, if you look at like our portfolio, when it talks about, um, you know, for example, our total equity is six, you know, the weight is 67.7%. But then if you look and you go, well, but we have money in a long shot, fund and it's 70% net long, doesn't that kind of, if, if you recalculated it and said, well, that's kind of, you know, adds to the, to the mix of uh, exposure to equities? Well, I think, I definitely think that's, that's a, a valid point. Um, so to put this in, in context of the work that we do for, for other clients, um, you know, sometimes we, we broadly define uh, or we broadly aggregate these different asset classes into growth assets and risk mitigating assets. Uh, and if we were to, to do that here, we would say that uh, domestic fixed income clearly is a risk mitigating asset. Uh, absolute return 
uh, is a risk mitigating asset. As, as you pointed out, there's a portion of the real assets portfolio uh, that's a risk mitigating asset. And so if you were to, to add those up, it would be you know, somewhere between 25 and 30% of the, the total portfolio. Uh, and that is fairly consistent with, uh, I would say the average uh, that we see for um, our defined benefit uh, pension plan clients. People seem to be fairly comfortable with somewhere between 25 and 30% uh, in risk mitigating assets. Rick, does, does a typical real asset fund have a coupon? No, it does not. Um, to Frank's point, it, it does invest in bonds and mainly emerging market bonds. Uh, and it invests in global equities to a degree and some other diversifying assets, but I'm not aware of a specific coupon with that fund. All right, so it's, it's, a, it's a total return vehicle. Exactly. Exactly. And I think it's important to note, Frank, we're not uh, saying get rid of PIMCO by any means. I think, um, you know, the current target to real assets is 12%. And under the hood there, 6% of that is infrastructure and 6% uh, is to the liquid real assets bucket, which is PIMCO. So there's an overweight currently to PIMCO at 9% versus the target of six. Uh, and that's purely because of the lack of infrastructure within the portfolio. So certainly not uh, suggesting, you know, that we, we get rid of PIMCO. I think we're just trying to under, you know, the, in terms of where it fits in the portfolio, you know, a 9% to one fund uh, for us in the real assets bucket doesn't necessarily make a ton of sense. And, you know, a 6% allocation, I think we, we can understand and justify. Uh, so I just wanted to point that out as well. I think yeah. I think the board looks at the real asset as what Jim was saying, a risk mitigating asset. So the bonds, the real assets, and the absolute return we look at as risk mitigating. We're not looking for those return for returns. We're looking at those to mitigate risk. Would that be accurate, Jim? The way that we that we're looking at that. Jim's muted, but I would agree with what you just said. Yeah, I think there's just, there is a portion of the PIMCO fund that does invest in equity. So there is some equity risk there, but it's not overwhelming. I mean, you'll, if we, when we look at performance, you'll see that, you know, it does do better in so from, from uh, a risk, good equity markets, but risk, sorry, go ahead. For a risk mitigating asset, what's been the, what's going to give us the best return as well as a little bit of risk mitigating, bonds, the PIMCO real asset fund, or absolute return? What's, what's given us better returns over the last three, five years? Over the long term, it's, it's the PIMCO all asset fund. Over 10 years, the PIMCO asset fund should return more than core bonds and an absolute return manager. Um, and I think you'll see that in our recommendation um, where we do suggest that, you know, I don't want to beat Jim to the punch here, but, you know, we suggest maintaining a real assets allocation as a part of that risk mitigating bucket and not necessarily increasing the overall uh, risk mitigating assets within the plan um, because of the outlook and, and because of the lack of those higher earning private investments that are going, that are not being invested. So you, you just want to reallocate, you're, you're just thinking about reallocating within the risk mitigating asset class. Yeah, I, 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 think, I, that, I think that's, I think that's fair. I think that, the, that we think that the existing sizes of the components make sense to us. I think, I think one point that I would make is that we don't look at these asset classes in, in isolation. Um, there are different uh, diversifying characteristics which, with these, each of these components, which is also uh, a contributor to the risk mitigation that they provide. Yeah. 
Joe, uh, Joe, I thought you were talking to the, asking the other Jim. That's why I didn't respond. <laughs> so that's, no, no, I, 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 I'm just trying to get a handle on what we're what we're talking about. But I, I, I think if, I think I understand what we're talking about. I mean, the other thing this points out is our discount rate is in trouble. You know, at the rate we're going, it would take us like five or six years to get down to even six percent. We're at seven right now, I think. Correct? Yeah, it's at the top of this page here. We're at six point no. eight seven five no. to six. No, we're three. at six and six and seven eighths right now, and we'll go to six and three quarters in June, in or July first. We're really dropping look, an eighth a year, right? Right, we're going down an eighth a year, hopefully, okay. six, to, you know, to six and a half. It's okay. We've been moving the needle at least, little by little. Anyway, I, when that, I get on the that, board, when I get on the board, we're eight and a half. Yep. So if you look at this maintain risk column here, the six point two eight percent there. Where are you, Jim? Uh, on the on this slide that's on this on the screen right now. The, yeah, okay. there you go. Yeah. 6.2, it's gonna take us five years to get to that that discount rate. Well, that's a different problem, obviously. Well, that's <laughs> the way you're gonna change that is the more aggressive, more aggressive mix. I haven't heard any reason to change what our target is. Just looking at we what what's in these columns, maintaining the risk level, our target return is higher. Risk is lower. Why would we change from the target? No, I, I'm, I'm not saying we should. I'm just saying our discount rate is going to be well above that for five more years. I understand. I would that. just add. I would just add, Charlie, that the actual column, so where where the current portfolio is, is is really the column that we should be looking at because there are such big differences between the current portfolio and the target asset allocation, with the lack of infrastructure and the underweight uh, to private equity, the, the actual column is really, I would use as, as where we are. Uh, so, you know, a compound 10 year return of five and a half at 11.7% risk. And the maintained risk level is, you know, a higher return at 10.66 uh, with a little bit more risk. Now what you're really saying is that we should move some assets around to come closer to the target rather than change the target. Well, actually, you know, this, this might be a good spot for us to, to move to slide 16, uh, which may make a, you know, more easily make a, uh, a relevant point. So well, I, I mentioned before- Could I say one thing? I don't mean to interrupt, but over the last seven years, we've averaged seven, roughly 7.2%. So we're above target and the target's going down. Heard, you heard that adage about, you know, past returns and no prediction of future returns, <laughs> something like that. I remember what the hell. Yeah, and I've also heard another one, if it ain't broke, you don't fix it. I'm an engineer. <laughs> You're an overachiever, Frank. <laughs> and by the way, one other thing, too, is when we talk about infrastructure, I don't know whether some of you remember this, but we also had money in Allende, right, Brett? And we got absolutely slaughtered. So, no, it wasn't a Linda. It was a prior infrastructure fund. Alinda, uh, I think, did okay. It, but there was but, another but, one that did very poorly. Is, if you look at our total infrastructure investment over the last seven years, it is not a return of 10.6%. <laughs> That's right. I mean, because, there again, right, right. So just remember, it's kind of like, okay, that, those guys, those big losses are gone because we don't have that fund here anymore. But in reality, we did not do as well as it, it's shown on this board. In right, which, which I think is, is why, you know, even after we did the education last year and there's really been no appetite to invest in infrastructure uh, that we've heard from the board, which is really why, you know, one of the reasons we're, we're presenting this today is if, if we're not gonna present it, why is it part of the target asset allocation? No, we got it. Well, I think we asked for it, right? That's why you're presenting it. Well, we do we do one of these every three or four years. So, but 
there are such big changes between the actual asset allocation and the target asset allocation that to, to Jim's point in this slide, trying to find you know, the, the right level of risk and return uh, while adjusting the targets on the margin is, is our ultimate goal here. Um, so maybe Jim, you can walk us through this and we can jump to our recommendation uh, given the time. I, don't, I'm, I know it's getting late for everybody. Yeah, yeah, I want to be conscious of that. Uh, the, the point that I wanted to make here is, is you remember on the, the prior slide, I mentioned optimal mixes. So for a targeted rate of return, the least amount of risk. So the efficient frontier represents that uh, across a wide variety of, uh, of mixes. So we have each of the four mixes on the prior slide listed here, and you can see them uh, titled next to each, each of the dots. And we have your existing target mix there, and that's the, or excuse me, we have the existing al uh, allocation as the, the, the triangle, the actual allocation. And then we have the target, and the target actually resides above the efficient frontier. And the reason that it does is it includes our expectations for both private equity um, and for real assets. And we think that a portfolio that includes those two asset classes can earn more return for any existing level of risk. However, having said that, um, you know, as Britt pointed out, we have constrained the allocations to those asset classes to you know, essentially where we think you're gonna be in the midpoint of this uh, time horizon with private equity and where you are now already with your uh, infrastructure investment uh, for, for, for two reasons. Number one, it seems to us that liquidity is an important consideration to you, and this, these are illiquid investments. And, and number two, as, as you pointed out, Frank, you know, you've, you've been burned in the past uh, with these and, and don't wish to take the kind of risk that these types of funds introduce. So I think what, what this says, and, and this, uh, I actually, you know, uh, I brought this up for the due to the point made earlier, well, why don't we stay with the existing target mix? Well, actually you can't, unless you, you propose to invest, to continue to invest in, in private equity. And uh, as Britt pointed out, you know, you, you'd have to uh, invest in, in new funds uh, in order to even maintain your, your existing 4% allocation. And you'd have to go back and reinvest in, in private infrastructure. Um, those are the only ways that you can get the kind of returns for the level of risk that the um, that the target mix is taking. You know, one of the things that happened. Uh, I'm sorry. One of the things with private equity that we I found being on the board, Charlie's been on for longer than than I have. But you know, some of these. I remember the guy coming in. 15 years ago and saying, well, we're going to be out of this fund in seven years. We still got some, you know, so that liquidity was a challenge um, overall. And it's, that was a concern for us. And we have done well. I mean, when we go over the, port, the performance, we're at 500 million, which is a new all time high. I remember we used to struggle every time we got to 400 million a few years ago, we'd bounce, bounce off and bounce, go back down. And now we've clearly broken out above it. And that's in a time when this fund is has a, has a negative draw to it. So the strategy we've had seems to have, to have worked. Illiquid private equity is only as good as the managers that are managing the private equity. And if there's a manager that's going to put a hundred percent of his net worth along with us maybe we'll look at it but these guys that put these partnerships together and they put these private equity deals together it seems to me like the cream is skimmed off the top and goes somewhere else and the other private equity well that might work let's put it over here that's been my experience with these illiquid private deals. Unless we have a manager that's going to put 100% of their net worth in the same partnership. Right. I mean, yeah, no, Frank, Frank and Joe, I don't think we're not, you know, arguing the, the point of where the portfolio is positioned or whether to invest in private equity. We're trying to understand 
the risk and return trade off of where we are now and where what we've heard. I mean, we've heard, frankly, from both of you that you're not interested in illiquid investments. And we've heard that for years and years. And <clears throat> we just think that the target asset allocation should be adjusted accordingly, uh, given that these are your investment beliefs and this is the way the plan is gonna be allocated going forward, what's the best way to allocate if we're taking those out? Can I ask a, a question? We would like to hear. <laughs> yeah, well, not everything has to be liquid, right? We just have a certain amount of liquidity. Correct. And, and there is some illiquidity in the portfolio. Your global equity long short managers like Blackstone aren't daily liquid like some of the mutual funds in the portfolio. Um, but I think the liquid illiquidity that Joe and, and Frank are alluding to are you know, some of these private equity funds that are currently in the portfolio may take another 10, 12 years and those to people, fully and those distribute people, the capital. And those people that voted to put those into this plan are long gone. <laughs> well, you know what? Forget them then. Well, no, but uh, wait. One of the things to remember is this in private equity, you can get into a situation where, you know, the portfolio is losing money and the private equity is saying, we have a capital call, we want cash. Yeah. And they're, and they're still making 2% that, a year. And that's what happened in 08. That's, that's what happened in, no. in, in uh, 08, 09. It's, and it was disastrous for people. Okay. Well, Jim, maybe um, you have any other yeah. comments on this slide or we can turn to our, our summary and no, recommendation? The only point on this slide was, yeah, it would, it would be, you, you couldn't earn the target rate of return. You can't maintain your, your target asset allocation in the absence of reallocating to real assets and private equity, which you don't want to do. Right. Only, only, only two of us don't want to do it. We can vote. <laughs> but, but, <laughs> we can vote on it. <laughs> right, but you're, but if I'm reading this correctly, you got compound a ten year return. It's still going to be under five and three quarter percent by what you're what you're recommending. And over the last what seven years, we've gone seven percent. What do we need you guys for? <laughs> <laughs> Let's move on. <laughs> okay. He's beating us up, Jim. He's beating us up. <laughs> next, next slide, please. <laughs> there we go. Britton knew what he was getting into with this. He knew all along, so this is not a surprise. I think, I think one uh, thing that tough maybe- crowd, Tough crowd, tough <laughs> crowd. Yeah, time, time to do the rope-a-dope here. Um, I think one of the things that uh, that speaks to you know some of the risk concerns is on on slide 17, uh, and that's that you know if you uh, compare the the existing target uh, you, you know with the the illiquid investments is is that in any given year over the next 10 years of our time horizon, uh, you know you could look at a 13 and a half percent loss with a five percent probability. That's that 95th percentile line at the bottom of the table. It corresponds to the uh, the bottom of the bars uh, at the at the top. Um, you know, so that's 13 and a half percent loss or or potentially worse. Um, and you know, Frank made the point that you know there there are times when you know especially in in 2008 where uh, people were liquidity constrained because the, the you know the public markets were down. They had net negative cash flow. This is the situation with you, although you're not dramatically net negative. Uh, and they were they had capital calls, and so uh, that can be a very challenging situation uh, if you have to fund illiquid investments. We can we can potentially reduce that risk in the 95th percentile uh, by going to a more conservative asset allocation, but but clearly that's going to have a penalty in terms of our expected rate of return, uh, which is reflected in any given year, which is reflected in the uh, in the median here. I think where I'd like to spend uh, a little more time is on slide 18. 
Uh, so this is over 10 years at a, a, a compounded uh, basis. And there are uh, a couple of things that I'd like to point out is that, you know, while in any one year you may have you know, uh, mid-teens in terms of losses over 10 years, that extreme rate uh, or that extreme loss is unlikely to be repeated. Uh, so that that uh, poor year is offset by other years which are better, which may also include some losses, but certainly not to the degree of that extreme single year. And so consequently, that 95th percentile uh, is significantly reduced. So now we're talking on the order of you know, less than 1% unless we get to an extreme asset allocation. And that's the good news. The sort of the bad news of that is that recognize that these are annual rates of return. So, um, you know, this, this would be per year, every year for uh, 10 years. So instead of for the, you know, maintain risk level, uh, that, that eight tenths of a percent loss actually represents an 8% loss over 10 years, roughly speaking. Uh, and, you know, that, that, that doesn't take into account, um, you know, again, the net negative cash flow. So your actual assets would be down further than that. Uh, the the other thing that I would point out is this problem. The, was there a question? Yeah, I was just say one thing to point out here is you're you're looking over here at the probability of beating six point seven five percent. If we continue on our current, if we continue on our current path of knocking off an eighth a year, we'll be in the low sixes over a ten year period. Well, we're not sure. I don't. For right now, my understanding is we go to six and a half and then review. And then we stay there? Well, it's review. not actually, okay. technically, it's not up to the board. It's up to the city. No, I understand that. But it's, it's I, I'm just making the point, it's not going to be six, seven, five for the next 10 years. Right. No, that's a good point. It could be lower, could be six for all we know, but it could be, it could stop right now at six and a half. Yep. If you look at capital markets projections, it should be ratcheted down for quite a while. That that certainly is the the trend uh, among public funds is to to continue to to ratchet um, the discount rates down. I would have to say that you are ahead of the game relative to many of the clients that that we deal with already. You know, going to be at six and three quarters at uh, you know this summer. So with that, I, I think we can move to our, you know, our summary and recommendations. So on, on slide 20, um, you know, we note a few of the things that occurred uh, in 2020 that um, you know, impacted our expected rates of return for the subsequent 10 years. And you know, that uh, in spite of the fact that we had that, that, that drop that we discussed earlier in the call with Blackstone in, uh, uh, in the March of, 2020, with the onset of the pandemic, the, the equity market has come back gangbusters. Uh, valuations are higher. We, you know, hit another record uh, in the equity market uh, earlier this week. Uh, consequently, we think what's happened. I mean, you know, Frank, you referred to the returns that you earned over the last few years. We think in many instances, actually, what happened is you you earned the long-term rate of return, but you earned it earlier than you expected, and so now this is going to be the the consequence of of that is that valuations got high uh, to the extent that they move toward the more long-term averages, that's going to be a, a haircut on returns going forward. It's worth saying too, though, that even though valuations are high, we're not projecting um, any kind of a market crash. Uh, the valuations can return to normal uh, by lower rates of return over longer periods rather than a, you know, a singular loss over a very short time frame. We also talked earlier about uh, low low interest rates um, and the Fed, you know, targeting to keep them low for you know at least the short term or at least over the next uh, several years, uh, and that's driving the bond market down with the aggregate, although it fluctuates, probably averaging over the last several months about a 1.2 percent yield. So uh, in this low return environment, we have to. You know, take into account not only the expected rates of return, but the volatility 
uh, of the portfolio, and that's that's really challenging. Uh, you know, volatility hasn't changed very much in spite of the fact that uh, returns have have fallen. Um, it's especially challenging to control volatility by having a significant fixed income allocation, given how low yields are. Um, so we really think that diversifying asset classes that have returns above those of fixed income play a significant role in the portfolio. So with that as preamble, if we move um, to the next slide, to slide 21, you know, here is, as, as Britt alluded to earlier, our recommendation is that you maintain the existing risk level. And by that, we mean that um, you maintain your domestic fixed income allocation at 20%. Uh, you keep absolute return at 4%. You know, relative to your existing target, the real assets fall from 12 to 6%, but recognize that, that that fall is really driven by the infrastructure, which you, you no longer have. Um, private equity, we anticipate about the middle of this period, you'll be at 3%. Uh, you know, there's not much we can do about that due to the illiquidity, but we think that that, that works out fine because the overall illiquidity that that introduces into your total portfolio is not really substantial over the next 10 years. So we're reallocating assets from the target allocation from uh, real, uh, real assets and private equity uh, in, into public equity uh, in order to uh, maintain that rate of return with the existing levels or maintain as high a rate of return as we can with the existing levels of risk mitigating assets. Makes sense. I mean, to me, we've been nice to Britt and Tom because I think Joe and I would have put them about 80% in stocks over the last few years. And uh, we have money in some of these, you know, like uh, long, short, et cetera. As they said, that's they're good buffers for us. I don't know whether basically you're saying to take money out of PIMCO and put it into say, domestic stock index funds. Is that- Frank, Frank, I thought you would have been proud of us for not recommending to increase fixed income. I know, <laughs> believe me. You know that's not gonna fly. <laughs> yeah. No, I think, I think here, we're really, when you look at the, the target versus the actual, I mean, when you, look, when you look at the actual, we're talking about just trimming PIMCO from 9% to 6%. Uh, 9% for one manager in a $500 million pension plan, we believe is too much. Um, and based on the modeling, a 6% allocation to real assets uh, is impactful and, and reasonable to maintain. The allocation of private equity, you don't have to change anything. It, it's the actual asset allocation is four. We're just suggesting increasing the public equity at the expense of trimming those two. Uh, so it's really just uh, reallocating on the margin, uh, some more funds to public equity to maintain the risk and return posture of the current plan. So while we've talked about a lot, <clears throat> I think that ultimately, you know, the changes between where we are today and what we're suggesting are really on the margin. Would you agree, Jim? Uh, absolutely. We don't need to do anything right now, anyway. So this is just this is for discussion. Well, I mean, at some we point we'd want to adopt formally adopt this, right? We're not voting tonight, are we? No, we're not going to vote. I, I would voting. recommend we don't vote tonight. I would say that you know this is something for us to consider. But again, we have bands that we I think we are in all even. Um, all assets, I think we're within the bands that we have set, right? Yeah, no, we're, you're in the bands. You'll actually see, you actually breached the band of domestic equity because of the run-up in equity markets. Um, but, you know, we're not saying you have to vote tonight or, or make any changes. This would be our suggestion to the investment policy. Uh, at some point, we'd like to revisit the investment policy statement. Um, we think that given where the current plan is uh, and the target asset allocation and, and the mismatch between the actual and the target, that it's worth 
uh, updating that and reallocating the assets into public equities to be more in line with, with where you are today. Britt, Britt are okay, there that's... any other changes to the investment policy that we, we look at at the same time or is this the primary thing? Yeah, it would mainly be the asset allocation and the ranges uh, around each of these asset classes. I think we reviewed it uh, about a year and a half ago. Uh, so there, there's probably not a lot uh, else to, to update. So can I make a suggestion? Um, maybe for next time we can do a side-by-side -side comparison of the targets and the ranges, right? Propose versus, um, you know, targets versus the ranges. Because I think if we have a visual of what are the targets and what are the ranges, how far off are we? I think that would help. Yeah, makes sense. Yeah, sure. Happy to bring that back to uh, the March meeting. I don't know. Just my so, my suggestion. I don't know. No, that's fine. We could do that. I think that though it's already like getting there on. Jim's um, Joe's going to give me a hard time because we're running well after eight o'clock. Um, but if there are any other, if there aren't any other questions of Jim, we could then move on to. A review. Yep. Yep. Thank you, Jim. Thank you, Thanks, Jim. Jim. Thank you, Jim. Britt, you're up. All right. I'll see if I can do the uh, 30 second version here. Bear with me. <clears throat> we could also fix the allocation by using the PIMCO all asset as a source of funds after we review our cash needs. Right, right now we might need cash. We'll ask Chitsume. When we get there, so we can take right. care of this, you know, so. Bear with me here. All right, can everybody see my screen? Yep. Yep. <clears throat> Uh, so as Frank mentioned, total plan assets over 500 million uh, at the end of December. Um, you know, you can see significant investment gains, uh, almost 18 million. In about hey, Rick, can, you, can you make it bigger? Is it possible um, or no? Let me see. Oh, good. All right. That will go better. So, so significant investment gains. We've seen, uh, you know, dramatic run up in equity markets. Uh, of late over the last year, you'll see that play out in the performance. Um, as I mentioned, Frank, um, domestic equity returns or domestic equity, no, we are within the range. So it's about a three, almost 4% overweight. The upper limit's 32%. So, so getting up close to it, but not there. Um, and that's, that's really driven by the market uh, and, and the appreciation within uh, mainly Columbus Circle uh, has done some uh, very well. International equity, uh, close to target, maintain, continues to be uh, an overweight to global equity long short. Uh, that 4 million that came out of Blackstone is not reflected here. Uh, so we'll see that in the next flash report. Um, underweight to domestic fixed income and real assets, uh, which is, you know, as you would expect, uh, given the asset allocation um, and I know Chitsume put in the order to raise $8 million uh, that was voted on last month from the Russell 1000 index. So that should hit soon to pay for benefits going forward. In terms of performance, uh, we'll just quickly run, you know, fiscal year to date through December, outstanding returns 16.9% versus 14.3% benchmark. Uh, active management really across the board has, has done well. Uh, you can see PIMCO on this page up nearly 15%. Um, I would highlight, uh, you know, again, Columbus Circle up over 51%, uh, just outstanding, up over 81% for the trailing 12 months. Um, I would like to have Artisan in next month, uh, if that's reasonable. You know, while this is a growth Manager, it's really growth at a reasonable price. So in these growth environments, uh, your international growth manager artisan will not keep up uh, with the with 
the growth uh, names as they do consider valuation in their investment process. Uh, we certainly still have conviction in them uh, and like the team, but uh, I think it's time for a portfolio review uh, given their relative performance over the last year or so. Um, other than that, I think, uh, you know, pension plan has, has done incredibly well um, over, over all periods. BlackRock emerging markets continues to eke out uh, relative returns versus the benchmark. And you can see your long short managers uh, have done very well fiscal year to date. Um, and your fixed income managers, well, fiscal years, muted returns as Jim uh, discussed, you know, over the last 12 months, uh, up over 8.3% for your domestic fixed income portfolio. Uh, so strong returns, uh, you can see across the board, three, five, seven years, uh, well above uh, the discount rate. Does any does anybody have any questions? No. Um, Chitsume, are you on? You're on are you on mute, Chitsume? Chitsume? Here we go. Yes. Do you we're gonna get eight million dollars out of um, the Russell? Is that right? And then we're gonna get correct, yeah. And then we're gonna get four million out of um, Blackstone. We already received the four million. We're just waiting for the BlackRock, um, the eight million, which should be um, settled this Friday. Excellent. So you'll have enough cash to go through March. Uh, to go through April. So April, I'll come to the board to request for um, funding. Excellent. Great. It's actually good that the, the Russell money stayed there because it's uh, markets appreciated since the December meeting. Um, any, any other business? Just before we, I ask for a motion for adjournment. Uh, oh, it's, it, let's keep going, come on. Yeah, you don't know, but I just wanted to say that, you know, if you realize we, the last time we met as a board in person was short, just two days short of being a year. I know. You know, and so I do hope that we will at least maybe sometime in June, if possible, all get together and have sandwiches and talk. I know myself, I miss the camaraderie we have when we are together before meetings and even sometimes after. So. Let's and do it. Let's go to shore and country. And then there's <laughs> then there's the sandwiches. Let's not forget the sandwiches. <laughs> right. Yeah. And the chips. Yeah. And the chips. That's right. That's the only time I eat chips is when I go to those meetings. Anyways, <laughs> if there's nothing else, is there a motion for adjournment? Actually, I have something I'm sorry. Else. I'm, oh, oh, sorry. I just want to let you know that the actuary will be presenting next month. Oh, okay. Oh. Okay, so maybe we'll bring Artisan in in uh, April. Should, should yeah, me, can we make sure we get that at least two or three days before? Okay. Yeah, it's just uh, yeah, it's just it's a lot to absorb in in the first time you're seeing it. And Chitsume, are they presenting the most recent actuarial study, or I just want I to confirm so, that because. Uh -huh. They're almost complete with the current actuary study. Um, I've seen two out of the four, so the, the other two will be coming shortly. Okay, great. Thank you. So we'll be doing the actuary and anything else that you can think of, Britt, you could just let us know. Yeah, we'll push Artisan to April uh, okay. in, in light of uh, that presentation. Perfect. Uh, motion, does anybody have a motion for adjournment if there's no other business? I just want to say again that Charlie, I'm glad you're okay. Thank you. Yes, we are very happy to see you back, Charlie. That's excellent. We're very happy to see you back. So I know we talked about it at the beginning and I just wanted to say it again. Appreciate that and I move we adjourn. I will second that motion. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? No? Motion's adjourned. Thank you, everybody, for your patience. Good night. Good night. Thank you. Bye, everybody. Bye. Bye.
Bye. Bye.